Uh, well, hello, uh, good evening, commissioners, staff. Um, welcome to the Planning Commission meeting of May 24th, 2023. I'd like to call the meeting to order. And we'll start with, can you hear me? Yeah, we'll start with a roll call. Yes, uh, Commissioner DeFever. Here. Commissioner Sai. Here. Chair Williams. Here. And Commissioner Woodward and Amir are absent this evening. Thank you. Um, typically, we, we turn next to the general public comment period. Um, we're not, I, know, I noticed the town council had uh, people attending by Zoom, but we're not doing that for planning commission we, we will be doing that after June 1st. Okay. There will be a hybrid for the public. And okay. so we will be bringing them on. So whenever there's a public comment period, we'll be bringing it on for that too. Okay, okay, great, great. Well, that's good we'll to We'll let hear. you know if there's anybody on Zoom at that right. time. Right. So um, there is no one in the audience tonight. Um, so I, I, I could go through the motions of, of offering <laughs> uh, the general public comment period, but I will not do that. I will turn to um, uh, the staff briefing. If there's, is there any updates for staff? And we may have some questions too, just about what's coming, coming up on future agendas. I, I have no updates for the commission tonight. Any questions um, for staff or on? I, I know we have the, the cow issue is, is scheduled for the June, a June meeting. It is scheduled for the June 28th meeting. The applicant is not available on the 14th. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have no minutes for it, uh, this evening. So we'll take that up at the next meeting. So we will turn to the first public hear hearing agenda item, which is the zoning code amendment. Uh, and I know there is a staff presentation for this evening. We'll start, we'll turn to that. First, I wanted to take a moment and introduce um, Mary Wagner, who's here, as well as Christine. Uh, Mary Wagner is from um, our attorney's office. And then there's Christina O'Rourke, who is our consultant for the general plan, and Matt Traker, who works for WRT and worked with us on the objective development and design standards. So they'll be taking part of that presentation. I also have Sam here, who is helping me out since um, I can't do both. <laughs> Honestly, I can't do both. Well, it's good to see all you right. all. Yeah. So tonight's public hearing is uh, town initiated amendments to the municipal code for implementation of the 2023-2031 housing element as per the state housing law requirement, uh, specifically to Title IX, Chapter 16 of the zoning part of our municipal code. I think it's important also to kind of give you an update. I'm sure you know this, but I, I just want to make sure all the commissioners know council held a meeting, a special meeting on the 22nd of May and they um, adopted the general plan and certified the EIR. Um, and now what's before us tonight is the zoning code amendment that relates to those housing sites. And um, with that, uh, unless you guys have questions first, I think we'll do our presentation and then you'll be ready to ask us more questions that are probably more specific. So I'm gonna hand it over to Christina O'Rourke. Thank you, Dana, and good evening, Chair Williams and Planning Commissioners. So tonight, um, we're going to start off by talking about the new zoning districts and the zoning map, and then we'll move into a discussion of our objective development and design standards, or ODS. So I'll talk about the purpose, the applicability of those, and um, the design objectives, at which point I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Matt Taker from WRT, and he'll get into more of the details about the odds. Um, and then we'll wrap up with the next steps and the staff's recommendation for the Planning Commission's action. Next slide, please. And the next slide. So as part of the zoning amendment package is a new zoning map, and this is implementing the general plan land use map that was adopted with the general plan by the town council on Monday evening. There are the vast majority of the um, parcels remain with the zoning designations and land use designations that they have had previously. The two exceptions outside of the downtown are 4576 Paradise Drive, which is currently zoned um, 
residential planned development or RPD but with the new land use map the this site is now designated for very high residential density or multifamily development and so the zoning map would um, and change that zoning district to what we're calling a new zoning district called R310. That's essentially the same as the R3, existing R3. The only difference is that it requires a minimum of 10 units an acre, and so a maximum of 12.4 units an acre on that site. The other site is the Reed School site, which is currently zoned for a residential multiple plant and with an affordable housing overlay. So for this site, we've actually um, taken the affordable housing overlay off of the site and we've zoned this is a new zoning district called R4 so that allows multifamily development and with a minimum density of 20 units an acre and a maximum of 25 and both of these sites are in the housing element so not only are we implementing the new land use designations and the land use map of the adopted general plan we're also implementing these sites from, from the housing element next slide please so the downtown is where we have the majority of changes occurring and we have two new zoning districts mixed use and main street and so a lot of these parcels like the mixed use all the way at the corner of the left side of your slide here on beach road is currently zoned for office and then along the west side of tibron boulevard where it says now says mixed use that's currently neighborhood commercial on the east side of Tiburon Boulevard at the bottom of the screen there um, are other sites that are again are currently neighborhood commercial but are going to be um, rezoned for mixed use and then we have this Main Street um, new zoning district <clears throat> along Main Street which is currently village commercial and then there's these other three parcels where on Beach Road where the where the uh, post office is those are currently village commercial but we're rezoning those to mixed use so again this is implementing the land use map and this is going to allow uh, mixed use development both in the mixed use district and Main Street and so the mixed use districts are going to allow housing with a minimum of 30 units an acre, a maximum of 35 units an acre, and that's allowing two to three story buildings. And so we'll have a maximum of 45 feet in height, except where it's adjacent to residential districts. And then there will be a maximum of two stories and 35 feet in those areas. Next slide, please. So part of the zoning code amendment are these revised use tables and you can see here what we've done is rather than identifying and listing each individual use we've actually grouped them in categories this is going to make it much easier for staff and the commissioners and the public to kind of use the use the code now next slide. And one of the things that we've done too, and we talked about this in December when we first brought this to you, and we've also talked about this with the, um, with the town council, is that we're changing some of the uses from conditional uses to permitted uses, and this is really going to help to streamline the approval process and also to remove a constraint to residential housing, to housing development, which is required in our housing element. So a lot of these uses like retail and personal services, most business and household services, most food and beverage uses and residential are now going to be permitted uses and won't require that conditional use permit. The code is prohibiting firearms, firearms sales and fast food services. And it also adds adult entertainment as a conditional use in the mixed use district. And that's a, a requirement from the first amendment and it is establishing um, uses that are not allowed along certain required commercial street frontages like ground floor commercial um, bus uh, office uses excuse me next slide there are also site standards in the um, in the amended code this is just a look at the mixed use and main street and village commercial standards i've already talked about the densities Next slide. Okay, so the purpose of the objective development standards. As we talked about in, back in October, and it's really detailed in the staff report, so I'm not gonna really go into this, but there are a whole slew of new state lib, 
housing laws that are really limiting local discretion and requiring the town to now have objective development standards. There are all, of course, there are already some objective development standards. There are things like setbacks and height limits and floor area ratios and lot coverages, and those are all objective because they're numeric. Um, but we wanted to give the town some additional objective standards to apply in the cases where it's required by state law. So these are like SB 35 and AB 2011 projects. So for those qualifying new residential and mixed use projects, the land use and design decisions have to be based on adopted objective standards. Next slide. And this is the state definition of what that is. Basically, objective standards involve no personal or subjective judgment, and they have to be verifiable by reference to an external and uniform benchmark. So um, anything that is attached to a number usually qualifies and it's an objective standard. But things like it has to be compatible with the residential neighborhood is subjective and, will, and cannot be used. Next slide. So odds applicability, the odds is going to apply to any new development like new buildings, additions, renovations in the downtown districts, including these new mixed use and main street districts and village commercial, as well as new mixed use development in the neighborhood commercial district. So for projects that qualify under state law, again, they're, they're going to have to be um, and based on the compliance with the odds. So, so for projects that don't require ministerial approval process and where subjective design guidelines can be used, the odds still establishes some of the underlining zoning standards, um, but then those, objective, those subjective standards like design review guidelines can be applied in those cases. Next slide. All right, design objectives. So one of the objectives of the odds is to, um, to deal with our housing element requirements and to figure out how to most gracefully accommodate these new requirements of having higher density in the downtown along Tiburon Boulevard and Main Street. And then the other objective is to implement the downtown design objectives that are now expressed in our new downtown element as well as implementing the new land use. Um, map in the land use element of the general plan. These, the odds were again, um, we were developed, we developed those with, after many meetings with the design review board, so those recommendations have been integrated into the odds. All right, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Yeah, great. Yeah, Matt Tacker. So just to continue on with the design objectives, and design objectives can be thought of, well, First off, just to reiterate, with objective development standards, uh, for certain kinds of projects, there has to be a ministerial path. And uh, in order to maintain uh, Tiburon's character and really uh, you know, enhance the community through the development and so forth, it's necessary to spell out certain rules uh, in advance. You have to try to think it through as best as you can in advance. And so in working with the design review board, and I believe we, you know, I know that I've been before your body, uh, you know, once before, uh, we've sought to, to, uh, to address a variety of objectives. Again, they have to do with community character, as well as the vitality of your downtown. So there's just certain ways that you'd want to build, a, uh, to put, put a building together in order to promote walkability, for example, or to make the uh, uh, environments feel safer and more welcoming. So beginning with village scale, and scale is very important and was uh, one of the things that the design review board focused on uh, mostly, uh, you know, is to break up uh, your larger sites in, down, in downtown. Um, uh, uh, the, since it involves commercial pro, uh, parcels, you have some instances where the parcels are especially long and, uh, and you'd like it really to appear as uh, individual blocks and with the possibility of Paseo is breaking up those blocks. Um, and then there, and then the, um, within that block, uh, there's a desire for indentations so that even within that, the buildings, it, it, it appears to be made up of multiple buildings um, through indentations and also, as I'll show you later, through other uh, ways of articulating the facade. Building st uh, step back and height variation uh, is addressed and articulation through allowable projections so that you don't have just a flat wall, just a kind of a box that's built out to the, its limits, 
but really have some in and out, some up and down, something that really feels more village-like in scale. Next. <clears throat> Pedestrian orientation, this is, you know, again, where urban design really can promote uh, the life of the community and, and make for safer and more welcoming places. Uh, restricting ground floor uses depending on the location. There's some places where you really want to insist on, I believe, we've recommended, you want to insist on there being a very active ground floor frontage, such as retail space. There's other places where it's not as necessary. I mean, it's a little farther away from your main street area. Um, the ground floor entrances and window transparency becomes very important uh, in, in, in maintaining uh, kind of pedestrian activity and, and, and continuity between your storefronts. Um, there's streetscape improvements that are required uh, so that as development occurs, you're also leveraging uh, a more um, a, a more enhanced pedestrian-oriented public realm. And then public gathering places are required of larger projects, uh, such as small courtyards. Next. And there's uh, particular attention given to this uh, intersection of Tiburon Boulevard and Beach uh, that uh, there are sightline requirements actually because of uh, um, emergency access, but actually those, those turn into opportunities for a kind of diagonal or triangular uh, plaza at those corners. And then uh, in the commercial ground floor uh, required where it's possible. So that at the intersection of these two very important roads, where you naturally have crosswalks anyway, and you're going to have pedestrian activity concentrated anyway, there'd be storefronts. Next. <clears throat> Promoting walkability and alternative modes. Again, I've mentioned activating the storefronts, the streetscape standards, reduced parking rates. Um, that has been, have they been reduced? I have to ask. Uh, not in the code. Okay, so that is, I think, a mis, I think mm -hmm. there's a mischaracterization. Um, what, what, what we have allowed for is lifts and tandem spaces, so that it's easier just to get the, the required parking into the building volume, and therefore the volume can be less than it would be otherwise. And then paseos and courtyards to avar, avoid large uninter uninterrupted blocks and some guidelines, in, or some standards rather, in terms of how those should um, be made more active and, and, and more welcoming. Next with buildings facing onto them. So then you get into some scale requirements. There's a great deal of detail, you know, in the standards, and I'm, you know, we're happy to uh, uh, go over any particular questions that you've got, but just to hit some high points here. Uh, this is a diagram that just, ex you know, shows how a long frontage uh, gets uh, broken up um, so that it appears to be multiple buildings, both by having a recess, um, you know, at least every 90 feet, and then even within the 90 feet, a requirement of having two different kinds of facades uh, within that, working on a 30-foot module, uh, which is very close to the 25-foot module that you presently have in terms of your very small lots that are in the main street area, um, which is, I think, a characteristic that the Design Review Board uh, picked up on and that we've pulled together here. So really limiting the width of the of the facade or the apparent width of the facade um, so that you're getting something that's much more uh, appropriate to Tiburon. Next. <clears throat> and then, you know, this is just a zoom in on one of those 90 foot increments just showing that in the, in the uh, mixed use area at least where you are allowed to have three stories, uh, you know, um, in the front plane of the building, um, you can only do th three stories for uh, up to 60 feet. After that, you have to step it down, and after 60 feet, you also have to do something that really divides the two facades uh, so that they really read separately, both through materials and other treatments. Next. And then this gives you the massing, the difference of massing in terms of the, uh, the main street area where you're, you're required to step it back um, at the second story. Um, so that the, uh, and because Main Street itself is a fairly sh uh, narrow right of way, looking up at it, you know, it's going to look like two stories most of the time, uh, and, you know, unless you are really, you know, at a certain angle and really craning your head. So uh, that's a way of getting the density that's, uh, that's necessary for the housing element, but then maintaining the scale, uh, the, the apparent scale of development on Main Street. Mixed use. Because you've got uh, Tiburon Boulevard is a much wider road, and you and 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 it has and there's an opportunity to recreate it as more of a village boulevard, um, allowing some greater height that helps to frame that boulevard. 
uh, but not not in a <clears throat> in a continuous uninterrupted fashion. There'd have to be some up and down. Next. <clears throat> This is a map that shows uh, the, uh, the zoning districts, but then also shows the frontage requirements. So where you see a solid, uh, a solid line and the hatch immediately uh, behind it, those are places where uh, retail frontage or retail-like frontage, similar activity generators uh, would be required. And then where there's the dashed lines, there's, there's, there's flexibility that there, uh, in most locations, I think Tiburon is not an exception in this regard, it's very difficult to, uh, the retail, the demand for retail is not sufficient to, to fill the retail space even if you were to build it. And so giving some flexibility where there's the dash lines. Next. And just, uh, you know, and, and, and one of the, you know, very important things is that buildings aren't hiding behind parking lots, um, that you're really lining the street with building fronts, with entrances and, and windows. Uh, which is <clears throat> very traditional and also is is a better way to uh, to generate pedestrian activity and to make things safe and welcoming next and then there's two frontage types um, you know there's the commercial frontage the commercial frontage is a requirement in the in the main street area but uh, is only, uh, is uh, and is required in some locations as I just showed in the in the mixed use areas but some places it would be optional and, uh, and so there's, you know, uh, what you, and, and a lot of attention to that ground floor frontage because that is, uh, that's at eye level, that's where, uh, you know, people go in and out, where there's this, the, the direct connection to, to the life of the sidewalk and the street, <clears throat> you know, with, over, with uh, you know, windows and entrances and canopies and things like that. Um, and adding, requiring a setback in the mixed use area so that uh, places where you now only have 10-foot sidewalks would become a 20-foot sidewalk because of the setback next. And then um, in the residential frontage where it's allowed um, in, the mixed, in the mixed use area and, um, and that setback in that case would be uh, uh, landscaped and, uh, and there's some different ways that you could have entrances. Sometimes you'd be entering into a vestibule, sometimes it would be a porch or a stoop uh, which would then kind of help break up the facade as you're walking down it, as is illustrated on the right. Next. Transparency in, uh, is very important. Um, you know, there's a, a, a minimum transparency requirement um, where the commercial frontage uh, is, is used. Uh, you can't have uh, large, uninterrupted uh, blank walls, for example. Next. And then open space is another thing that we addressed, and just very briefly, uh, uh, we recommend uh, keeping the per unit open space requirements that you presently have for residential areas, uh, and allowing that some part of that requirement be met by having uh, with shared shared open space. So giving the, uh, giving the higher density projects the flexibility to put open space on roofs, for example, or in courtyards, um, or you know, along paseos and all. So there could be some shared space. And, and, and this really honestly, uh, uh, something like a three bedroom apartment with 300 square feet would not, you, you would not be able to get that amount of open space associated with that unit with multifamily uh, unit uh, projects. So it gives, the, it gives flexibility and sometimes for the, for the larger numbers that you see there, it's a, it's, an, it's, a, it's a necessity to make it work. Next. This is Dina, who's gonna yep. take this. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. And then, okay. So what are we doing next and what is the recommended uh, um, action? So we're asking the Planning Commission tonight, <coughs> excuse me, to adopt a resolution recommending approval of the proposed amendments um, to Chapter 16 of the Municipal Code to the Town Council. Then the Town Council is scheduled to consider this through introducing the ordinance, ordinance excuse me, on June 7th. The town will then develop odds for multifamily developments in the R3-10 and the R4 zoning districts. We have not 
had, we do not have those quite yet, but we'll do the same exercise for those hillside developments. And that is where we are today. Next slide. And if you have any other questions, we are absolutely here to answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a very helpful um, uh, presentation that sort of brought the staff report to life. <laughs> uh, so I suspect I, I may have a question or two, but I, I'll turn it first to my fellow commissioner, Kathleen DeFever, for questions. Okay, I have a few. Uh, just as a preliminary overarching question to make sure we all understand why we're here and uh, to risk sounding naive, but I would like it to be on the record. Why is the Planning Commission being presented all of these detailed standards now and we weren't involved in the drafting of the detailed standards? Are you referring to the objective design standards? Yes. Yes. Any, anything you just presented to us, so, really. So I would say that you have been involved in those. We came before you several times to discuss them, as well as to the Design Review Board in public settings and in public meetings. Um, we talked about how we were going to look at these uses and um, generally did involve you throughout the process. So you have seen this before, um, and we haven't made many changes to what was brought before you. Then we went to council after that, and it was another public hearing for that. Okay, I, I recognize the skeleton, uh, and, and I was suspecting that part of the answer to my question is a lot of it is the housing mandate. Well, well of course we're doing this. So I would step back and say, our exercise here is to implement the housing element and the zoning needed to accommodate for those units. So yes, that is why you're here tonight. Okay, I have some specific questions about, I think I understand which parts are the housing mandate and which are not, but I wanna make sure that I do. Um, we saw, uh, Christina O'Rourke showed us the tables of the permits, what's a conditional use permit, what is ministerial, one, what is not allowed at all, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of sweeping change in there, and I'm curious as to why a lot of the permits that we as planning commissioners are accustomed to having before us are no longer going to be before us. They are not conditional use permits anymore. I mean, huge, huge lists of them, and I saw the changes in the ordinance. Thank you for laying them out and putting the strikethroughs in them. What happened is my question. Why have they all changed so much? So part of what, what we do when we do these text amendments is also try to clean up what we, what we see may be issues. And part of what we're trying to do is streamline the process for, let's say, a restaurant um, that's going in and to be able to have that commercial vitality that we're also trying to do downtown as these new units come. As we're looking at new areas, this is solely a cleanup of that. Um, you can certainly recommend something different, but in a lot of instances, except for things like bars and nightclubs, um, the restaurants have had to go through a very long process to get approved, even without music and a bar. So um, I think we were trying to clean up some of that to streamline the process. Yeah, and you know, being a resident of Tiburon, I do hear the disgruntled voices about some of those processes. So I do appreciate that being an initiative. Uh, I myself noticed that there were so many of them that I'm a little overwhelmed at how many of them are being changed all at once. But I will continue with my questions. Um, okay. I have a, also a, another answer that might be helpful. And that is because some uh, projects that are anticipated would be streamlined would be able to follow a ministerial process that if there are uses that you would like to see then they are permitted and if they were under conditional they might be passed over for some other permitted use in order to follow the streamlined process so the idea really is to target those identify those uses that you'd want to allow if not encourage um, even though, even, even though there may be some issues that would normally be picked up on through your conditional review process, but so that, so that a developer would have 
have almost an incentive to deliver the uses that you like to see on the ground floor. Yes, and I do understand in Tiburon that is a consistent issue. Um, okay, I had a question about... Well, you're thinking about that. May I ask yes. a, just a follow-up question? Um, just out of curiosity, who, who has the review authority for a ministerial decision? If something, if someone's unhappy with the ministerial decision, where does that go? To the council? Do you mean if, if we make a decision at a staff level um, yeah. to do? I'm familiar with our conditional use process and, and then what happens if, if someone disagrees with that so, process. So I guess I could take this in two pieces. Let's, so we have different processes yeah. for different I know. ministerial. I know, I remember the uh, kind so, of the box, I just can't so think of who's. Let me break it down, so DRB, Let's say we made a decision at a staff level to approve something. If we had a neighbor or somebody that wished to appeal that, it would go to town council. Um, with uh, respect to a This plan question is just specific to the um, use, the permitted, if, if, if something right. someone if said. There's, yeah. If there's an objection to our ministerial for a use, it would come to you in, um, you know, if somebody had an objection, right. we would bring it to you. Okay. Or if we felt that when we sent a notice out to tell people it was happening, that it was controversial, we would bring it to you okay. for things that we have that authority to do. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry. It just it was relevant to that last question that you asked. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, if you would be so kind, there was a chart that um, Ms. O'Rourke pulled up called the Site Standards Chart. Fairly early in your presentation. I'm not sure I fully understand that chart. If you could, like, well, I'm not sure I understand what the changes mean to Tiburon, I guess is my more specific question. So when, when we say lot size, minimum square feet, 10,000, what are they now? What, what kind of change is that for Tiburon? The lot size minimum, I think, uh, uh, commemorates uh, an established standard. Um, what it means is that the, in very few instances, you've got some lots that are less. And that would, that would trigger the need for, uh, for discretionary review um, in order to have a permit to, to get, get past that requirement. Um, the residential density um, and uh, both the maximum and minimum um, commemorate the housing element recommendations. So those are consistent with um, what's been discussed and, uh, and then recently was adopted um, in the general plan. The floor area ratio is just a good, a good practice which means, uh, which forces a developer to sculpt the the facade so that, uh, so that it's not always being built out entirely to the absolute maximum building envelope, but has a little more variation in terms of the, uh, the ups and downs. Um, and, and we've looked at that and it, those, those numbers uh, are appropriate to the density um, numbers, um, but also would force a developer to be less than what the building envelope would be otherwise. Um, again, so that uh, a, a good designer then has is forced to make some decisions in terms of where they might want to have a little more additional step, setback, for instance. Um, and then the block width, that is a new standard, and that, that, is the, uh, that is the standard that we showed in the, uh, uh, the 3D uh, diagram that... Um, that's the place where we're saying, hey, even if you have a really long frontage, say 300, 400 feet, you've got one frontage downtown that's 400 feet. And in comparison, if you take a Portland city block, it's 200 feet. So it's saying, hey, if you have a really big parcel, you can't just build wall to wall along the street. You've got you've to break it into pieces. I think that's all of my questions at this time. Uh, Commissioner Sai. Uh, my questions relate to um, the issue of the conditional use permit changes that you guys are proposing. So it, it looks like on, um, for example, page 35 of the, uh, I, th I think it's exhibit A, it, 
page 21 of 68 on the bottom right, the page on the designation. That looks like where you breadline out what currently for the NC zone are the various instances where um, CUPs are required. Later, there are red lines in the chart. That's table 2-3 alpha. Is, is that where you've now, it, that's what it kind of looks like, where you've placed many of those same things and, and then split it up amongst things that you've kind of determined to be committed as in ministerial and you as in you still need to get a CUP. That's correct. Um, I, I think, Dina, you said a second ago, and I think I understood it, that the reason was to try to s streamline where you can streamline mm -hmm. for various, uh, various of those things that are pretty easy for staff to make a decision that it, that it doesn't require a CUP. That is true, and also to to kind of tag along from what uh, Mr. Taker was saying was, we are trying to make it so that we can actually streamline these projects that come into us that have a mixed use component well, so I, I that we didn't I have, have before. Okay, so I, I have a couple of questions related to that. So with respect to the housing issue, well, oh, I guess your point actually is that for certain of these establishments <coughs> that, are, that are mixed use by by having the ability to, to have a ministerial streamlined process, it would thereby allow the, the housing to be a relatively That's correct, because you're looking at sort of a ground floor commercial component to that mixed use. But for purposes of this chart, or this table 2-3-A, it doesn't, it doesn't actually distinguish between those businesses that would be mixed use or sole commercial. So, okay, right? Okay. Mm. It, and that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I just wanted to clarify that because I understand the purpose that you just said, Dina, but it doesn't address I, where I, I think there's a bit of nagging concern that I have, which is for, for some of these things that are streamlined, I, I think they do make sense. I mean, they make intuitive sense to me, except that there are various things that I recall where we've had a lot of debate um, at various points with respect to CUPs that fall under certain of these categories and what you guys classify as food and beverage. And the reason I mention that is not because um, fights we've had in the past on CUPs, we, I encourage to have again. In fact, we don't necessarily want those, but um, they do illustrate that there is a lot of sensitivity related to many of these things mm -hmm. that might seemingly be good for ministerial approval or maybe disapproval, I suppose, <laughs> but um, deserve some more studied opinion and, and discussion. And, and so that is, and so it's the food and beverage one that mm -hmm. kind of really made me um, kind of think that. A and so that's kind of just my read off of this. I, I think there's a lot that's built into this that does make sense to kind of split up in the way that you guys did. I think it was actually a rather smart way of doing it. I'm just not sure right now that I agree with <laughs> kind of how all of them are split up. That's, that's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, yeah. so let and, me try and I to. Would actually, just to, uh, I think that I sort of share um, the concern in particular about the the food and beverage um, categories that uh, I do remember speaking about this and, and providing input um, into some of these uses. And it's, you know, we've been doing this for several years now, so it's really hard to keep track of our input and how that input has changed over time as other commissions and council members have weighed in. So I definitely remember speaking to, you know, this issue and some of the needs, uh, both at the very local um, uh, just it is a matter of efficiency and also to um, to further you know to to achieve sort of mandated state goals as well um, to streamline projects uh, but I but I completely agree with Commissioner Sai around the level of discussion and debate we've had about uses over the past conditional uses um, that was partly why I wanted to ask about the review authority. If, if, if there is an issue with a ministerial decision, where does it go? What is the recourse? 
you know, it's, that's not the final decision. It would sounds to me like it would come to us. Um, and so maybe that the, addresses some of those concerns. Well, and, and, and to the point, I guess the concern I have is that to the extent, it's not so much that there will be ministerial disapproval such that there might be some appeal through the, to the Planning Commission. It's more that there might be ministerial approval almost on a pro forma basis that would, before we know it, change the complexion of things in, in certain of these areas that are not kind of, there's no nef nefarious intent by anybody, but it, it, it can, it, it can right. change quickly. I wonder, this is somewhat of a question, I might say it as a statement, but it's really kind of a question, is I wonder if some of what's outlined in Table 2-3 uh, Alpha, there could be language that we could build in that would designate that, that to the extent it's mixed use development, mm. that mm. it would allow for ministerial approval. But if it is solely commercial, uh, a, a retail building that is only going to be commercial, there is no housing uh, involved that it would require conditional use. And, uh, and it's, again, kind of a question slash statement. I say that because I wonder if that actually might have the effect of encouraging more mixed use, encouraging um, inclusion of housing and things. Because one overriding aspect of this, but I stand subject to correction to the experts who are here with us tonight, that much of what we're talking about with this, the housing element are things that theoretically and hypothetically could happen. But there is no mandate, there's no promulgation that housing has to, mm -hmm. in fact, go here in the future. So to the extent that there is still the possibility that these various areas that we're rezoning would continue to be only commercial, things that we could do, including making things ministerially more efficient, quicker, faster, streamlined, to encourage more housing, I think, is something we would want to do. And so I guess that question part is, is that, is that something we could include language-wise? So I think there's a misunderstanding because in the, in the mixed-use Main Street, um, we're requiring a minimum residential density. So if, if, uh, if it is redeveloped, it has to have housing. It has to have a housing component okay. to it. So, and this goes back to the earlier question I asked then. So, for example, things that are outlined in Table 2 3A, are we talking then about hmm. redevelopment that necessarily would have a mixed use, a housing component to it? I, I think if we're, if we're talking about um, an existing commercial building and we're just changing the use, then, then it would, this table would still apply, correct? So that's the, so it would be the problem. That, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, so Therein that's lies the problem. The problem. But, yeah. the, but the building's not changing itself. It would just be the use. And, and in that instance, so I'm glad you used that hypothetical example. It could be any of these buildings that we mm -hmm. have in downtown where part of this kind of theoretical exercise we're talking about is facilitating a framework where housing is encouraged and, frankly, as a legal matter, could be developed. Okay. But... Based on some of these changes, you could have any currently purely commercial building continue to be used as a purely commercial establishment, and, and changes could be made, and this table would allow for that ministerial process. Okay, it, assuming I still have that, <laughs> then, then my statement slash comment is, if we really want to encourage, really infuse housing into some of these developments, even in a building that otherwise isn't changing, they just want to switch it from this business to that business that otherwise would require a CUP, to say, you don't need to do a CUP if you're going to change this and include housing. So that's, that's, that's uh, yeah, and so that goes back to your original question, I think, which is, is it, I think the proposal is adding language, which seems fairly straightforward, which is just ex specifically stating if it's a mixed-use development, then the process is ministerial. Some sort of qualifying language, I suppose. And, and what it seems to me to do, because we always want to make sure we're not kind of building too much structure in a way that's going to be inefficient, is it, 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 just, it doesn't actually change the status quo. So for those buildings that are going to continue, despite what 
the state is saying we have to do is going to say, I'm going to continue to be just a bank and a bank building and that's it. That's okay. But you're going to have to go through the regular status quo process that currently exists. If, however, you're going to include housing, you want to change the business, that's where I think you get the benefit of some of that, that streamlining. And uh, Commissioner Sai, would that be that language qualify each each category here, or were you specifically focused on the food and beverage category, or some categories over others? Because I think all, uh, Dina has also raised the point that there's just a, a, a just wanting to make this whole thing more efficient. So, so I, I personally went through the list looking to see if there were um, any, and again, I'm still talking about Table Two Dash Three A that I disagree with. I largely agree with. Mm -hmm most of these, the only ones that I, I actually have a slight issue with, I already articulated it, is the food and beverage one. And mm -hmm. so that would be one where, at least with respect to what's currently proposed there, that it be, that the language be at least applicable to that. That the default would be, it is a you, unless mm -hmm. it, it's, it's mixed use. Th it, this uh, requires a bit of kind of smarter people and, and <laughs> to be done to it. Um, yes, um, Commissioner DeFever. I've endorsed the idea. <laughs> actually, How do you feel? I actually disagree with the idea, actually, okay. but I'm not sure this is part of the portion we should be discussing this, maybe. This is just the Q&A with the, with the presentation, and we have public with us. Yeah, so absolutely. Push that forward? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It's just, it's, it's helpful to get that kind of feedback of them as to what's possible and how it might. So maybe think about that. I'll be certainly coming back to you with questions after the public comment because I do have questions on some ideas that have been proposed. So if you want to think about this suggestion. So, so I only have one um, comment because I'm going to be the sound police tonight. <laughs> um, Commissioner Sai, when you speak, could you make sure your mic is on and you're close to the mic because I got a comment from um, someone who's watching us separately that it is not audible. You are not audible, which is shameful. Is that shameful. is always shameful. It's also, it's also <laughs> not among the criticisms I get frequently. But, <laughs> but, but See, <laughs> every once in a while, you're soft-spoken. But the light is illuminated. Is it supposed to be not illuminated? I think if you sit back in your chair, all comfy, when you're talking to us, we can't hear you. So you have to s sit up close to it. it uh, this is one of my new roles. I get to be the sound police. Ha happy to do that. Um, I do have one question just about the presentation and what I'm seeing in the staff memorandum. I think it's pretty straightforward. It's really just I'm not understanding. Um, I'm, I'm not visualizing what's what's being described here. And it relates to, um, it's on page 7 of the staff memorandum. Testing. Uh, and what, this is relating to Juanita Lane, um, the five-foot building setback required for Le Juanita Lane. The odds draft that had been presented to us in November required residential street frontage along Juanita Rain, but this provision has been removed because the depth of adjacent lots may make it infeasible for a building to front onto Juanita Lane while also fronting onto a surrounding street. Um, I do remember this discussion on November 9th. I'm just not, I think I'm just not understanding the kind of the change and it, not at all flagging this is a controversial change, just wanting to better understand it. Yeah, that's right. So um, we have some, places along Juanita Lane where the distance between the Juanita Lane right-of-way and the the other street, which is Tiburon Boulevard in one direction or Main Street in the other direction, um, where it's 120 feet. And so, you know, if you really do the math in terms of how a building gets laid out and you have sufficient room for a viable uh, retail space and then enough room to get the parking in, uh, in a re reasonably efficient way and so forth, there just is not enough room to also have um, a ground floor residential space facing onto Juanita Lane. Okay, and that probably was discussed in DRB at the Design Review Board level? It, yeah, it was. There was a hope, you know, I mean, Design Review Board members, um, not all of them, some of them held out hope that there would be a way to uh, make residential frontage work and we uh, we pursued that we chased it down we even did sort of a design uh, study uh, to test it and determined that really uh, the area uh, the areas where it's deep enough to actually have a residential frontage is, is quite minimal along with one needle lane just really not worth the 
uh, worth the effort. Just allow it to be, allow it to be a service um, alley. Um, if a, it, it doesn't prohibit a developer from from facing residential, there's no prohib prohibition on it, but it removes the requirement. Understood. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Very helpful. So, any other questions just on the presentation, the staff memorandum, before we uh, open this up for public comment? Okay. Um, all right. Well, let's open up the public hearing uh, and. All right, yes, yeah, <laughs> it's just you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, welcome back. Um, and uh, you absolutely have three minutes tonight. <laughs> and yeah, and, and state your name in the record, yeah. My name is Jim Oh, yes, we, we, I think we were conserving the battery power. There we go, hi. So uh, my name is Jeffrey Chan, and I've been living on Old Landing Road for 30 years. Um, shortly after leading the charge to annex to Tiburon, actually. Um, I apologize, first of all. I'd like to start by apologizing for being out of order last meeting. Um, and I won't do that today. <coughs> I, Apology um, absolutely accepted. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I made several proposals in my comment that I emailed earlier today. I, it was late mail number seven. And uh, I, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at them, but I'd like to summarize them here. Um, I propose that the commission should not start the rezoning process or recommend approval of the rezoning of site H or the multi-unit sites downtown for several reasons. The, the deadline for rezoning the housing element sites is not until January 31, 2023, seven months away. HCD will not be making its decision on whether Site H is suitable for inclusion until 60 days from submission of the adopted housing element. HCD may decide it's not suitable, in which case the rezoning for purposes of the housing element would not be necessary. I believe the commission does not have information at this time sufficient to support a finding that rezoning site H to R310 would not be detrimental to the public health, safety, or welfare of the town. And I've asked um, to, um, well, in the meantime, the, the commission should ask the staff to take prompt action to conduct outreach to residents about the town for their interest in, um, in light of the new ADU, JDU zoning ordinance to solicit their written expression of interest in developing units within the planning period and to work with Mr. Winter and LAFCO on pre-zoning and annexing site, H, uh, site J in order to generate a surplus of adequate units that might be substituted for site H and perhaps some of the more controversial downtown sites before the rezoning deadline under the no net loss rules. I also propose that when or if Site H is rezoned, it be conditionally rezoned to give the town more time. Mayor Ryan invited members of the public to speak with him after the town council meeting about the safety and other issues raised during the meeting. I spoke with him today, and he authorized me to tell you that he supports the proposals that I made to defer rezoning, to work quickly to generate substitutable units, and to conditionally rezone Site H if appropriate. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, just stay if there are any questions. Um, oh, well, uh, for the any questions? Yes. I have, I have one question. Sure. Hi, Jeff. So, uh, what's the benefit to delaying it? If if the council has already approved it, right? What does delaying it till twenty twenty four accomplish? If you rezone now, the rezoning is going to stay forever, even if HCD says Site H is not suitable. And that will then, you'll have created that zoning for that site unless you then pull it back. The benefit of, of not doing it is that you might not need to rezone the entirety or any of it because under the no net loss rules, there would be time, seven months, where you could substitute in additional sites to address the safety concerns um, and all the other concerns and effectively present a, a different housing element without site H or some of the MU density sites. That's, that's permissible. And so all that's driving things now in terms of timing is that seven months. If, let's take the seven months and see if we can't do a better job where HCD is still satisfied, but also the other concerns. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Sure. 
Thank you. Very Thank you so much. much. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak this evening? We have one other person in the audience. Um, okay, that's very different from a few weeks ago. <laughs> so we will uh, close the public comment period and, and um, have an op give staff an opportunity to address, um, uh, I think, proposals. I certainly would like to hear more, probably from Mary uh, Wagner, about the proposals to defer this decision, um, uh, given that there is this uh, uh, January 2024 deadline. What is the implication vis-a-vis -vis the uh, adoption of the general plan and certification of EIR and kind of the HCD process? And also, what is the implication for just the, in terms of the application of the builder's remedy? And that, obviously, it's, it's all related. Um, and, oh, sorry, you had also brought up a conditionally approving um, site H, um, and so that was something that came up at the last uh, meeting, and, and we had a question about that. And I think you've, uh, the uh, Mr. Channon has provided some more information about what that would mean, how that would look, even the language that that would be used to conditionally approve. So we didn't have that before us last time, so we hadn't addressed, we just didn't address that proposal. So um, thank you, Chair Williams, members of the Planning Commission. Um, a lot to unpack yeah. in that question. <laughs> Um, and I'll, I think I'll start not in compl complete reverse order, but let me see if I can Any address order all that your, works for you. your questions. One of your questions related to the builder's remedy. And I think, you know, we've all heard a lot about the builder's remedy. We talked about it at the council meeting on Monday. And um, the language in the Housing Accountability Act, that's the so-called builder's remedy, indicates that adoption of the housing element would prevent use of that section. As I indicated to the council on Monday, it's a defense. So if somebody brings a builder's remedy project forward, the city would say, we self-certified, we have an adopted housing element. That is not an applicable provision for you to utilize. There are other provisions in the Housing Accountability Act, however, that talk about sites that are included um, either in your housing element for low or moderate income households or in your housing element or other um, portions of your general plan that designate a particular density for that site that may be different than what is in your zoning ordinance. So right now you have a situation where you've designated sites in your housing element at particular densities that your zoning ordinance hasn't caught up mm -hmm. to yet. So someone could submit a project mm -hmm. under those provisions and um, the city would be obligated to process it under the density that's in your housing element right. or other provisions right. in your general plan. Right. The benefit of having zoning in place is that all the detail that goes along with the policy decision to make a designation at a particular density goes into your zoning ordinance. As you all know, the general plans, you know, like the master um, guiding document and then the detail gets worked out as you go down through specific plans and the housing element, I mean, excuse me, the zoning ordinance. So um, one benefit of adopting the zoning prior to January 1, or January 31, excuse me, 2024, is that you have those other standards in place. Um, with respect to so-called conditional zoning, you know, I've heard that utilized in the context of um, annexations. I think, I, I believe the concept is, and, and if this isn't what the commission understands, please ask me a follow-up question is that you could defer the application of the zoning until a, a period of time. For example, you could recommend that the city council go forward, but consider having the zoning go in place at a later date. That's one mm -hmm. thing you could, you could consider. Um, and you could consider that the, you know, the council take other actions that the commission may desire. I think that hit all of it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And so um, just to that last point, if, if it's, if it, if it, um, is deferred till a later date. I mean, this issue that came up around what if that site is rejected by HCD, um, in which case the zoning does seem, you know, um, superfluous or un unnecessary if, if that is not accepted as a, a viable site. You can always modify your zoning. I mean, you can't right. come in. It, it applies for a period of time until modified. Right. Um, you know, adoptions, or introduction, second read, 30 days thereafter, it goes into effect unless a later date is right. included. So that would come back to us as a modification of the zoning, but it would, uh, uh, so uh, uh, doing zoning now would address the, some of the risk that you identified. Um, 
some somewhat right and just to be clear to this site particularly site H is not designated or not um, assigned lower income or even modern income numbers for your, to meet your arena it's assigned all above mod um, right numbers and you know in, this is somewhat anecdotal but it would be unusual for HCD to outright reject a site and just say take that site out they're more likely to say Eh, you need to find some other sites that meet this same requirement for any of the sites designated in your your housing element. I would also um, add on to that by saying that this site was is in the housing element that the draft, the version that went to HCD, and they've already reviewed it, and they had no comments on site age. They did ask us for additional justification of some of the mixed use sites. It is common for HCD to have kind of a, a higher bar um, for any sites that are identified for lower or moderate income housing, or particularly lower income housing. So it would be also unusual for them to, you know, with this version, when we send it back to them, for them to have new comments that they haven't already um, brought up. I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it would be a little unusual. Um, and it's... They don't reject a site. They say, you need to come up with better justification. And here's potentially how you could justify it. But they don't actually right. outright, outright reject a site. OK. They make us negotiate against ourselves, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or, they, or they say, you know, you need to justify um, that there is, you know, uh, property owner in interest the likelihood in, of it actually in being developing developed. it because I think you a can't, lot of yeah if you can't demonstrate that exactly. then, then you, yeah you've taken yourself yeah. out of the running right and I think partly that some you know towns and cities have been proposing sites that everybody knows you know they're they're trying to get around some of that yes I think behavior mm -hmm. um, but but does the um, conditional zoning that the chair asked about does that address the does the conditional um, zoning issue address that issue of if it's the case that HCD were to reject it, that an adopted zone, set of zoning regulations could be conditionally um, subject to HCD's approval of that site, of Site H, for example? <coughs> I, you know, I think that would be unusual <laughs> um, to include in a zoning ordinance, and I think that my recommendation would be to delay the effective date of those to, provisions. Okay, to functionally get to the same. Okay, yeah. And, and if I may make one other observation right. that, that may not be really applicable in this situation because the time period is relatively short. Some jurisdictions adopt zoning before they adopt their housing elements um, for a variety of reasons, and some jurisdictions adopt it concurrently or as soon thereafter as possible to start housing incentive production, right? Because the whole goal, when you step back from your, for your housing element, is the, the production of housing. And you have to meet in your annual progress report, annually, you have to report to HCD your progress toward meeting your ARENA numbers. And jurisdictions that don't meet their ARENA numbers, um, and I think the next check-in period is four years into the planning cycle, you could find yourself on the SB 35 list, either anew or again, and then you are subject to streamlined ministerial processing of projects that qualify, you know, that meet certain criteria that are outlined in SB 35. So while that might not be an incentive in this case, it is definitely a consideration when you're thinking about right. getting your zoning in place. So, and, and we do, uh, that's, thank you, that's helpful. I mean, obviously we have, this is a, a you know, a, 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 a site that, is we've been on record saying is is problematic, um, and so we're particularly interested in options around this um, this site. Um, the if, uh, uh, so there are sort of two things here that two ideas about this delaying the effective date. One is if there's something comes back from HCD and it turns out not to be viable. And forgive me if I'm not using the proper language. <laughs> and then the other is just that also allows time to look into other options that have come. Before, before us, before staff, one of which is Site J, which is, I recognize is not in the town of Tiburon, would have to be annexed. And, um, and 
potentially a, a substituted for site H and what what has what is staff's thinking on that site that came up actually in the middle of our meeting <laughs> um, la the last time and so we hadn't I don't, we didn't have the benefit of a full analysis on that so so I haven't done a full analysis because I don't have an application that's the first thing I have looked at that site and um, it has a, at least an average slope that is over 34% throughout. I mean, it's a pretty steep throat, um, site. In addition, when I look at the map and I think about LAFCO, there's a piece of um, that, like adjacent or on the other side of Paradise, that uh, LAFCO may say to us, you have to take it in because we can't create a county island. So there's a large kind of analysis that has to take place about whether or not it makes sense fiscally to take on that piece because it means then you have a larger portion of Paradise Drive that we may end up having to maintain, which is something that we share now with the county and it is a huge financial hit. So that's an analysis that has to take place. In addition, looking at our short time frame now and you know, that site's a huge site. It's interesting to me that nobody's ever developed it, which, you know, lends me to say, you know, it's been vacant. There isn't even a single family home on it, um, that it is a tough site to develop. That's the, aside from that, just timing wise, you're looking at probably two years before we would get this done, if not more. Um, if we decide maybe. to take it in, the annexation. I mean, the town has to actually say that they're interested in doing that, and I think the analysis is pretty, um, it's pretty lengthy. I know that for um, the, the site H site, it took us close to two years to get annexed. That was a smaller parcel. Um, we didn't have an issue about creating an island, um, and the analysis was a little simpler. But nothing's impossible. I just have to know that there's a, a bunch of for lack of another word, hoops, I would have to go through and time and then we'd have to, I think mostly I think I'm really concerned about the fiscal impact to the town as a result of annexing that piece of property and, and, and the effect on Paradise Drive and creating, having to take in actually additional properties as part of that annexation. But I haven't, I don't have an application to know what LAFCO's response would be either, what? but it's just my assumption. Okay. What is the fiscal impact if Site H is developed and we have to contribute to changing Paradise Drive there to adapt to that many housing? So normally when a developer develops, we're going to have to, you know, they may have to do a signal there. It may have to figure out how you get in and out. I don't have a proposal in front of me, but normally that becomes a developer's responsibility. What I'm talking about is the maintenance of that roadway is now currently shared with the county. The county takes a larger percentage of it. The more property we take on that fronts Paradise is a greater fiscal impact to us for maintaining that roadway. So I'm not sure that it's a beneficial thing for us to do, and I do believe that it is at the least a two-year process. That's just based on what I looked at with LAFCO in general and the process where we're working with them and us, even if you have a willing applicant. Well, I do appreciate that. Um, that's exactly the kind of insight that, you know, I, I certainly don't have. So I do appreciate that um, assessment of the, just the timeline and, and some of the variables that would go into an analysis. Are there any other, uh, other questions? Yeah. Um, I just want to clarify, I understand. I'm not sure if I missed some of the explanation you just provided. So we could, conditional zoning is possible. It just hasn't been done. And what, what was the other answer uh, provided that we could wait? Or I'm sorry, I'm sorry for not catching the full answer. Um, one suggestion I made is that you could make a recommendation to the city council that if they choose to put the zoning in place now, that the, if, you know, if they adopt the zoning ordinance, that it doesn't go into effect until a later date. G typically, you know, you have an introduction of an ordinance and then a second meeting to adopt the ordinance and 30 days thereafter it goes into effect. You could say it will not go into effect until X date. 
So, you know, the, the commission has lots of options available to it in terms of what you want to recommend to the council. I think one that you made or referred to at the beginning is you could, if you chose, request that the council defer any zoning modifications to site H um, or any other you know, actions that you think would benefit from deferral. I'm going to ask you just to slow down because I, this is such an important for, for us, I think we take this decision very seriously. So I want to make sure personally that I understand. And you're so, this is what you do day in and day out. It's not what we do day in and day <laughs> That's out. That's why I'm so, asking you to repeat. I'm so, sorry. So, yeah. So if just as you're going through the options, it's really helpful that, for us to take good notes and think, think Well, and, and just to be clear, too, these are options that I'm hearing based on your conversation. Right, so right. I'm hearing what Absolutely. the Planning Commission so is appreciate. discussing. And yeah. Not, We're yeah. all ears. We're so appreciate it. So I'm not creating them. <laughs> you know, I understand. Yeah. They're, they're flowing from what the, that, the Commission's that discussion has been. So one, So request you know, council ha defer any zoning. You have, you have a plethora of options available to you always, right, when you're making a recommendation to the council. One of which, as I'm hearing from you guys, your discussion, is you may want to consider asking the council to defer adoption of zoning changes specifically applicable to site H. Certainly an option you have before you. You could alternatively recommend that the council consider adopting all or some of the zoning modifications in front of you, but to have a later effective date than the normal effective date. Okay, that's that's so helpful. Because I, I was wondering when you when you talked about the holes, you know, kind of differing all of the the um, the these changes. Um, I had I, in my mind, I had been thinking specifically about site H. That is the issue that I think I'm grappling with the most. So very helpful to kind of understand the nuances between the what you're hearing us say and how we'd implement that. Yeah, um, thank you. That's really helpful. So. I'm hearing that we could even defer uh, everything, not just site H, if we so chose to do, that we don't feel comfortable adopting everything wholesale at the moment. You could make that recommendation to the council. Um, I, th I think it's important to just keep in mind that you know, these projects can come in at the density identified in your housing element. and. You have a lot of standards going into effect, particularly in the downtown and with the odds, that won't apply uh, until the zoning is in effect. Are you That's saying a double negative? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we got it though. I think we, we got it. We got it. We got the gist. Are you saying that someone could apply during the seven months and somehow uh, take advantage of a loophole because we haven't adopted the zoning? I wouldn't call it a loophole. It's a provision in the Housing Accountability Act that says if a property is designated in any portion of your general plan at a certain um, density, for example, someone could submit an application for a project at that density and you can't deny it because it's not, your zoning doesn't allow for that density yet. So you can't deny it. You have to allow it to go forward under, through the process, and you can't you're say... You're not forced to prove it either, hypothetically. No, you're limited to objective design and development standards, and you can't, you know, limit... You can't reduce the number of units or um, deny the project except for very specific uh, reasons in the Housing Accountability Act. Which is the case anyway, even without adopting the zoning. It's the case for any properties designated in your general plan, including your housing element. So it's already the case anyway. Correct. I, 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 think, I think the question is, in this context, whether the adoption of zoning as it applies to R310 would functionally make any difference if there were no, if zoning was not adopted. What you identified, I think, and and talked about is the, the mm -hmm. builder's remedy. And I'm going to ask you a question in a second about builder's remedy because it may not be the case. It, it seems to me, and it, and, it, and it seems to be articulated in a letter that's late mail number three, that basic, and I encourage everyone to, mm -hmm. to look at it right now for purposes of this discussion because I, I think it goes to the, the heartland of what Commissioner DeFever is asking about. But basically, in... Late mail number three, which is a letter from the Goldfarb-Lippman law firm, 
on behalf of uh, Sierra Pines Group LLC, articulates this idea that in the absence of the zoning regulations um, under Government Code Section 65589.5J4, that in the words of this letter, the town must apply zoning standards to uh, facilitate and accommodate development at the density allowed by the general plan. In other words, the letter goes on to say, if you don't implement zoning, and specifically the zoning regs we're talking about, R310, um, then the town's going to be powerless. And, and I want to make sure, Mary, that's what we're talking about right now as far as this discussion is concerned. And that's what you're talking about, I think. Does it say that town's powerless or just that the general plan is rules? It, 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 the, the, there would be no zoning applicable because the, the I understand. It, but the town would have to permit it. Okay, so the, the, the standards sorry. wouldn't apply because their zoning is not in place for that site. So you wouldn't have your zoning standards. So let's separate the builder's remedy oh. from this provision in the Housing Accountability Act, which um, Commissioner Sai, you just referred to, because they are different. And if you want me to go again through the builder's remedy, I'm happy to do it, but I don't think that's really the question. I think the it's question not the question because it's a different provision of <laughs> right. that particular government code section. I just wanted to clarify that it's not the same and you're saying it's not the same. Correct, They're, they are different, similar, but different. Um, and different again from another provision in the Housing Accountability Act that talks about sites designated in your housing element for low and moderate income households a whole nother section that applies to that. In this instance, when you have a, land, a general plan designation for a use of a site that is different than your zoning ordinance, you, and for housing, under the Housing Accountability Act, you have to let that project go forward and can't say, no, you can't do that because our zoning code doesn't allow it, because your general plan does allow it at the density designated in the general plan. I don't think you're powerless um, in the context of there are still objective planning standards that apply. It's just not, you just haven't developed any particular planning standards related to R310 zoning. Similar to what you're doing for the downtown right now, you're creating those objective standards for that increased development downtown in the odds. So, so I, I happen, I think that's very cogent analysis and it speaks a little bit to what the chair mentioned a moment ago because I happen to agree the, neither the commission nor more importantly the council is in fact powerless. What I did not like about this letter from the Goldfarb Blitman Law Firm is that it very implicitly creates the suggestion that uh, and, 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 and puts it in a format to simply to say, if you don't do this, you're going to see this parade of horribles of builders who come in through what Commissioner DeFever, I think very appropriately, appropriately described as perhaps a loophole. I don't think it's correct. I think it's legally flawed. And I think that there are in fact plenty of, of, of provisions in place that would discourage a builder in good faith from trying to come in to Tiburon um, to attempt to build, attempting to use a loophole. I, I'm not mm -hmm. persuaded by that point whatsoever, and I just wanted to make note of that with respect to this letter. I thought it very mm -hmm. suboptimally um, advocated for uh, uh, as to that issue as, as far as the exigency of having zoning adopted right now. Something that came up at the last meeting, and I just wanted to ask Steph, is it was, I believe that we, we learned there that there is no application for development on the table with Site H, and there's nothing contemplated. I have no applications for any of these sites. Right. Okay. I think what, I mean, my fellow commissioners can disagree, but I think what we're trying to do is allow some space because we're hearing the concerns of part of, you know, the Tiburon Peninsula. I almost said constituency. Unfortunately, they live in the county, but of course we, we take their word to be just as important. They're our completely next door neighbors, <laughs> quite literally. Um, we're trying to allow some space because this whole process happened really fast and we've had very few choices as a planning commission. And it is our job to listen to the people and to try to allow for the, 
frankly, the constituents and our neighbors to come up with solutions that maybe are better. And with the state, I mean, I'll be colloquial and say breathing down our necks, they have been making it so that we have almost no options to do that. And so I don't know if you disagree with me, my fellow commissioners, but I'm looking for ways to allow a little breathing space because this hasn't even really settled in, uh, at least with the commissioners. And I, I know town council, just from what we heard from our speaker tonight, I think they go back and forth themselves on, <laughs> on what's the right choice here and what isn't. Sounds if like we it. can find a way to allow some space for seven months, I would really like to do that. Right. I think some of the letters have had some really creative ideas, sending a mass mailer about ADUs. Maybe we, enough people would be interested in ADUs. That's completely possible because most people don't know about the new regulations for those. That's just one example. We just haven't had time. So I'm just... Articulating right. that maybe to help my fellow commissioners <laughs> along with through. the articulations. And just, to, just before, as a matter of process, before we get into comment and um, uh, deliberation, I wanted to be, make sure I close the public comment period. You okay, did. Thank you. Because <laughs> uh, typically we go, we just sort of do the rebuttal and then I close the period. So I may have done that a little bit uh, prematurely, but um, uh, it's different in this instance. It's a different setup. So um, yeah, no, thank you, Commissioner DeFever, for for sort of. Providing that kind of, uh, I, I certainly share that overarching um, uh, concern, and 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 it's not a it's not a criticism. I'm actually no. really before I turn it over to Commissioner Sai, I want to hear from him, and then I can conclude. But I did definitely want to acknowledge the hard work that has gone into this, and it's a hercule it's been a Herculean sort of effort. We are contending with so much new law, new information, new directive from the governor's office, from the state. Uh, lots of input from the community, and that is just, it's, you, I think you've done a tremendous job, and I do want to commend staff and the consultants for that. Um, I do, you know, recognize that the process has been a process of discovery for all of us <laughs> as we get input from HCD and others. Um, and so some things are, we, we don't feel like we have as much time to really grapple with and come up with, um, you know, fully informed solutions and decisions. And so I, I share that kind of desire, especially hearing that town council members may share that desire. And after watching the town council hearing, um, I'm, you know, some really informative, I learned a lot from listening to the town council members as to the context and the history and some of their insights. And so providing them with an opportunity to also be a part of this conversation around, does it make sense to allow for some some room to breathe. May I ask one more question? Um, I think in the last slide, Dina, that you had, it, it indicated, it may not be the last slide, but you indicated that um, odds had still not yet been developed mm -hmm. for one portion. It, Hillside. What, is that the area that covers this site that we're talking about? Okay. It covers yeah. both the Reed School oh, and okay. the... Um, uh, site H, we would develop hillside objective design standards for um, multifamily residential. So it wouldn't just, it would be citywide, but it, we're doing it to address those two sites in particular. I understood. So can, can you clarify how the, this, the zoning issue we're talking about right now, which applies to this R310, interacts with the fact that odds still have not been developed? So we do have um, the hillside guidelines. We also have other standards in our code that we would refer to if someone came in. So that's how we would have to kind of maneuver through. Um, we intend to start that process immediately um, and get that going through the process so that we'll be ready when you know we adopt this. So in the event zoning was adopted by the council for R310, there would still be, upon that adoption, no existing odds applicable to R310, but there would be, I think to your point, otherwise applicable hillside. Guidelines, from guidelines. the hillside guidelines. Okay. That's... There are, and we do um, have other objective design standards. And, uh, and other there was standards. a resolution that we adopted, as we called it, kind of the stopgap 
Fair enough. And we would look a at and that. other standards at play as well. That's correct. Christy, I'm sorry. Yeah, you... I was going to say, uh, so Table 2-2 in the Code Amendment does add some standards for R310. So that is 30% maximum lot coverage, 15-foot front setback, 8-foot side setback, 30-foot height maximum, 15-foot height maximum for accessory buildings, 0.6 maximum FAR. So that has been added to the code. So if the code was adopted, it, we would have, those are objective design standards or development standards. Those but, would apply. But they what have we're been talking about is having more standards, more descriptive, like what we did for the downtown districts, step backs, building massing, that sort of thing. And I'm glad, Christine, you said that because that I think that answered, I think, what my next question was going to be, which is it's, it sounds like then the difference between if we adopted the zoning versus if we didn't adopt the zoning, that someone coming in to build what you just described in Table 2-2, it would be the absence of those additional standards that yes. wouldn't apply. That, that to me, is what makes that, that letter that's late mail number three somewhat misleading because I don't think it accurately reflects the fact that there are, in fact, existing standards. To Christine's important point, there would be the delta are those things that are proposed and, and outlined in Table 2-2. Uh, They're existing for, for R-3. They're not existing for R-3-10 because we're proposing to add them to the Correct. table. Hence the delta, right, exactly. So, you know, the, what, what I'll say is, you know, I, th there's, a, there's a lot of this that is, that has this feeling of, um, of rush. And so I, I agree with, I think, a sentiment that Commissioner DeFever was saying. The, the reality is that this has been presented to us so many times. So we've seen it <laughs> in, in so many different forms. What we've not seen, I think, is it kind of com combined together in such a format that the kind of the, the, the we're, we're looking at a whole now versus kind of just the individual parts that we originally saw them in this particular instance at least with respect to the, the the public comment that mr. Shannon was nice enough to provide and a lot of the discussion from the last meeting is that the the town council has spoken and has indicated that the general plan is approved so it it doesn't really seem to me that the Planning Commission should be kind of proverbially fighting City Hall, trying to now obstruct a process and not adopting zoning that is otherwise an integral part of what the council has said is otherwise approved. The reason why I was so interested in this discussion, and Mary was extremely kind in, in talking through less smart people through a lot of this <laughs> process, so I certainly appreciate it, is that there is, there's a lot of appeal and logic, I will say, though, to this notion of what harm happens if it is delayed. And, and, I, may, and I don't even know that delayed is the right word. It, it, it's really, is there an exigency today that says the zoning must be adopted? And, and what I'm hearing is that there really is no exigency. We don't even have, however, by the way, you, you think of that word, we don't have, for example, a pending application. That's, 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 that's Dina's information from a few minutes ago. So there's really nothing that says something imminent is about to happen. What we lack and what we would not have is what Christine just provided, which is so useful, which is that those additional set of standards and, and two dash two, which I think are actually pretty important and, and, are, and are additive to this process. But I, I ultimately like the suggestion amongst many that uh, Mary had indicated are available to us by way of recommendation mm -hmm. that would put a, a trigger date, for, for lack of a more elegant description, a trigger date for when it would go into effect. Because it would then still permit this process to continue where people who clearly want to be heard could still be heard, including, but not limited to, going to HCD and continuing to go to the town council. With respect to where we are in the process, <laughs> I'm very comfortable with that because it, 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 it puts it where it, it needs to ultimately be, which is um, with the council and us facilitating a decision that the council has already made, but giving the council, if it wants, the additional time to be able to continue to work with the community 
it, and it may very well decide that it wants to change its opinion. It's happened before. <laughs> so wh wh where I'm left with this is, my view is that I think we should adopt, at least with respect to this, I, I, on the other ones, I've, I've got an opinion, but I'm not sure, Chair, if you're entertaining discussion on the other parts of, of, the, of this. Um, of, these, of the zoning. Of the zoning so, that we're talking right, about. Right, right. But at least on this component, right. R310, my view is that we should adopt it, um, but that we should put a conditional uh, time that it goes into effect. And do you have thoughts on the time, the, the trigger date, that timing? I, I, I don't because that's why we have right. people <laughs> who, who can what advise us on that. What makes the most sense? But, but you know, what, what we know is that I think this was the information from Mr. Shannon that we're talking about a January 2024 time period. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, I had proposed, and I think it was a very inelegant way of doing it because I, I, it had a look of confusion on Mary's face when I said it earlier. <laughs> was, could, we, could we frame it in such a way that it's contingent on um, HCD's approval? And, and I agree, that might be a little too Rube Goldberg-ish. But I do wonder if it could be hinged to January 31, 2024. So it, 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 my, my, Suspicion is that with, with Dina's correction, she's, she always feels free to do that with me, and, and I want her to, that with the adoption or with the recommendation here of the zoning regs, again, for R310, it would still permit Dina and staff to work in earnest and in good faith for the adoption of the or d development of those additional odds that would need to be done. But again, with that conditional timing trigger would still allow for what I think is very important mm -hmm. discussion. That's a, an important point, meaningful to me, that Commissioner DeFever and the chair um, also made uh, notion to. Well, what is the effect of that on the town council, though? Does that, I'll let them discuss. <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, uh, I, I didn't finish because she, yeah, I, she saw, was starting, I was letting you we think. We were waiting and, for you to finish your, your own deliberation over there. I just wondered if that suggestion is helpful in the way that Commissioner Sai is hoping or if it creates another burden for town council because if it's conditional, maybe it's more difficult for them to change their minds and send it back or, or procedurally is it, is it easy for them? Let's say it's conditional, but then other sites come up and town council decides they'd rather send it back to us before the conditional period uh, expires. I guess we're asking, what is the process? Uh, what would what the process be? Like? Are we yeah. helping town council by doing that or are we making it more complicated? And, and, <laughs> and uh, before, before we get to that, I think going back to your question about, are we talking about site, site H in particular, um, that aspect of the, of the proposed um, uh, amendments, or are we talking about the whole thing? I would like to be, I, my view is that the narrow, the narrow uh, um, uh, apl applying the trigger date to that narrow issue is the way I see this going forward because I do think we've spent an awful lot of time on all other aspects of the, of the, the, the um, zoning code. I, um, I still have remaining issues about the list of the CUP, CUPs not oh, thank no you. longer being. Thank you. I have, I have a lot. That is a, that so is a, maybe thank not. you. No, the thank you so much. The answer to that is maybe yes. not. Maybe yes. it's not that I'm, narrow. I really appreciate the reminder that that is an outstanding issue that we were actually going to turn back to. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, but, and you have, do you have concerns about other aspects of the, Beyond, anyway, let's. Uh, the commercial permits and site H, I don't think so, no. Um, so, the question I think that you were asking was, are, is this a facilitative of this process or is this some way going to hinder things down the road? Certainly something we're, we're, we'd feel comfortable with to allow some room for further, further discussion and work among council members and community members and staff. I think the town council will appreciate all of this input and I think they too understand the concerns regarding site H. They heard from a number of people on Monday. Um, so I think you know, the provision of your thoughts on an option for the town council to consider would be um, you know, well received. So making it conditional gives them options. I guess that's my question. The, the council has all the options open to it. Okay. You know, once, once you've made a recommendation to the council, that goes forward to them. They can accept that, you know, modify it. They can send it back to you. 
they have all those tools in their toolbox. Okay, so it doesn't make it more difficult. It does achieve what we'd like it to achieve. Just checking. <laughs> yeah, again, I think the town council will appreciate that feedback <laughs> and your insight on, on what you think the path forward is with respect to this difficult issue. Well, I think it's very valuable to have their brains on this as well. I mean, just after watching their discussion and, and the public comment at that meeting and providing for that additional forum, you know, I was really just, you know, impressed doesn't, you know, can properly convey my humility in, in you know, the, the, the brain power that was brought to bear on this issue by, by the council members and community members and impacted, uh, potentially impacted people. So um, I'm glad to hear that they would be open to, for, you know, further discussion on this and this particular recommendation that would allow for that. Um, Commissioner Sai, did you, did, did, just so I'm clear, so, so it sounds like the, easy, the easiest thing to do is, is as to the whole shebang, <laughs> we, we recommend um, approval with this trigger date of January uh, 2024. Well, I still have outstanding issues with the COP list. So, so I, and that's yeah. right. I think so I wouldn't would, include that. I, oh, I was saying actually, we'd, it would be the whole. We'd be this. This trigger date would apply to the to everything before us, so, not just so, specific to site H. Well, I, I which don't. Would allow for us to communicate those concerns to staff and to town council. Because I'm not sure staff tonight has had enough time to think through. You know, what are the, how do we want to this language that Commissioner Sai has proposed? I mean, maybe we propose that language. So um, I'm going <laughs> to unintentionally <laughs> complicate this again. So it does seem to me that there, that we can think of this as one holistic thing. I mean, it is in some ways, but also as individual parts, which it also is. And, and, I, and I think subject to correction that we could make this concept of a conditional effective date applicable to the zoning for R310. And we could then make, of course, our recommendation as to the other remaining parts of what's being proposed as far as the zoning regulations today. I also have some issues that I wanted to discuss that I've already articulated with respect to uh, the conditional use permit issue. I'll defer to Commissioner DeViver in a second so she can make her points. I, I did want to suggest to the chair that it might be the case depending upon what Dina says, that um, that staff will need time to develop some language because I, mm. at least my recommendation would be that we um, request that staff take back as to the CUP issue that we have discussed tonight, what kind of language could be uh, developed that would um, incorporate kind of the concepts we talked about before, whether there's something workable that could be developed as to allowing for this more streamlined process that Dina and her team have been working on, where there is specifically mixed use at play versus retaining what, again, I've euphemistically referred to as the status quo for conditional use permits, um, where there is no mixed use at play. So that, that was kind of my idea, but again, I defer to Commissioner DeFever um, on her the points that she wanted to make. Yeah, well, I'll start with that because I'm not sure if I'm misunderstanding what you're suggesting, but I'm trying to play that out in my mind on how that would impact the businesses of Tiburon. So if you have a building that's freestanding and only has a business in it, we're suggesting that they would need a conditional use permit, whereas a new building, which has commercial in the bottom and it's mixed use, it has residential at the top, they don't need one. I think that's discriminatory inadvertently if that's what we're suggesting. Um, I would rather that we went through and just found our concerns and, and used what's already written here without trying to adapt it to, you know, mixed use gets an exception and the other buildings do not. I think that's fraught with potholes. <laughs> um, it could, because my concerns are pretty specific, uh, food and beverage for sure, but I, you know, I, I sit and imagine given our experience as planning commissioners, how some of these permits might play out. For example, liquor stores, let's say a mixed use 
uh, building comes in and they want to put a liquor store on the, on the first floor and it's right on the corner or it's right next to a daycare, I, I don't know, daycares are in here as well. I mean, the people of Tiburon are, we live here, we know that the residents of Tiburon really value having a voice and that's why we've had so many conditional use permits required in the past on things that really at the outset you would think probably are pretty benign. I mean, I myself, as the commissioner, have looked at some of the applications and thought, it's just a restaurant. <laughs> and then people come in and they have some really interesting points about the music levels or the opening hours and how it impacts everything as a whole. And those are just the restaurants. But you have things on here like mortuaries, liquor stores, bus depots. I, I, I can't imagine there not being uh, persons in... Tiburon wanting to have input on where the bus depot is or where a liquor store is. I think this is too sweeping. I'm not saying it's not a good idea to shift some of these categories to permitted rather than under the conditional use permit, but I think it's too sweeping. This is my, my um, input. <laughs> right, no, thank you so much, yeah. Um, a question just on how we got here, <laughs> because it's, it's been a while since I've seen um, this particular um, issue, and I do remember having some discussion about it, but who else has weighed in on this kind of what we have before us now? Um, uh, and uh, that may be a question for staff. You know, how, how, how has it gone from, how has it wended its way through the process from when we saw this last, which was probably in November of um, 2020, where, where are we? 2021? Or 2019. Um, to where we are now, is it the, was it the council, was it? So it did go to the council in February. I'm just trying to remember all the dates. There's been a lot of uh, various hearings, but it did go to council in February, yes. The, these particular, all, all of what we see before That's us correct. now has, yeah. council had reviewed it yes. in February. Yes. And, and, did, and did they provide feedback on this section? Not that that might not be the kind of thing that you can pull out of your <laughs> memory bank on the spot. I'm going to ask Christine to do that because I, I don't remember them having... I wasn't at, the, at that meeting, um, so right. it would have been Bob. Maybe. Mm. I don't know I, if Matt was at that I, meeting. I looked but, at, um, Were you there, Bob? You know, it, I mean, I mean it, was, it was substantially the same. It was in a different format because now it's been put into an ordinance and it's a zoning code amendment. So previously it was kind of... Part of the general... Up. It was... All, oh, right. It was, it was, it was in a um, separate document. So I think it looked different, but yes, the the um, it was presented to you before, you know these uses, and it also was presented to the town council. Um, I would want to just make sure that we are understanding. There are two tables, by the way. There's two dash two. So there's one use permit table for the neighborhood commercial district, and then there's another one for the mixed use and Main Street. Um, so it's two dash A, right? So there are two. I think they're virtually. Do you the mind same. telling us where they are? Oh, oh um, I'm sorry. I, it's page it's, twenty. Yeah, I think it's it. page twenty one and twenty eight. I think it's twenty. It's twenty. Twenty three. Twenty three. Twenty three. Twenty four. Twenty three. Twenty four. Twenty eight. Okay. Twenty nine. And. We're going to bring them up on the screen Thank as well, you. if, we, if you yeah. give us a moment. Um, and so, so yeah, so walk us through. And I just want to, yeah, so which one are we looking I don't have my glasses on. We're looking at the mixed use one. The mixed use one, okay. So the permitted uses, there are retail, um, souvenir shops, personal services. Dry cleaning establishments with on-site processing is a use permit, but it's not allowed it's got the dash, right? No firearm sales. Food and beverages permitted. But then when you go down to, on the next page, um, the recreation and entertainment, recreation facilities, theaters, meeting halls, hotels, those are all use permit. Um, and animal care and boarding is use permit. Child care centers, mortuaries, and funeral homes are use permit. Um, no medical or non-medical marijuana facilities. Automotive services are use permit. And then transportation facilities, like bus stations, ferry terminals, those are use permits. Communication facilities are all use permits too. 
So it's the ones that are permitted. Some of these are state law, so emergency shelters, accessory dwelling units, um, the residential uses, those are you know uh, transitional supportive housing. Those are state law, so that has to be um, permitted. And some of these are in the housing element, and we need to you know remove, as I said, remove the constraints to housing development. So we're really talking about, I think, a limited number of categories here um, that are permitted that could be changed to use permits, um, retail, and, souvenir and, shops, personal services, and, and et cetera. A, and a question of clarification um, as to your last point, the chart 2A and 2-3-A, so that's page 23, starting at page 23 and starting at page 28 for those who are following the, the report. Um, those are currently status quo things that require a conditional use permit. Is that right? The things that require the commercial use permit are the ones in the, so it's what's crossed out on page 21. And that was in the neighborhood commercial district. Because again, remember, we're creating these new mixed use and Main Street districts. Um, and, and I'm trying to figure out, because I think it, it, it goes to a really important point that Commissioner DeFever was raising, because I don't actually think that um, her point and my point are in that much disagreement. But what's reflected on 21 is similar but not exactly the same as what you all have reflected in the two charts, right? S Right. Okay. I mean, and we were trying to, you know, group them into no, categories. Uh, understood. And yeah. by the way, not a criticism in the slightest. Yes. I just want to make sure we're clear. 21 is not exactly the same as what's now in, in, the, in the chart. And so the, the question, my question is what is now reflected in what you described as the consolidation and so forth charts, are, are all of those things status quo currently things that require conditional use permits? Um, so I Let me understand. So the ones that you have crossed out right there in front of you are the ones that we would normally have a conditional <laughs> use uh, permitted? Yes. Okay. My, some, but that's not my question. My, my question is, forget that page. Forget okay. page 21. <laughs> <laughs> Only focusing on the two charts, okay. which are, again, in, in Christine's words, right, a, a combination, categorization of things. Are all of those things reflected in those two charts currently things that status quo today require a conditional use permit? So I think I was answering it in a different manner, but with no change to the code, they currently require use permit today. Everything in the new table that's Everything, being proposed. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So okay. And by the way, my just you know, my question was not a trick question. It really wasn't. I just wanted to make. Sometimes <laughs> I don't always understand. So I, I just understand. Make that's sure. trust me. The confusion is always with the fault of the questioner. In that case, me. So my question really was just trying to go to the issue of whether there's anything that's captured in the tables that is something that right now you guys already can approve without a conditional use permit. That's all I'm trying to figure out. And so. If you look at this list where everything's crossed out, it's pretty exhaustive. So really, most everything requires is, a use uh, permit. Okay. And yeah. that was kind of part of the issues um, that we, we've been wrestling with. It, it, and Like a I'm, shoe store, for mm -hmm, instance. And I actually find that to be a pretty persuasive point. There, there are actually a, a range of things that really, by all rights, should be something that is, we've been using the term, kind of ministerially approved by staff. And that's in part the point that Commissioner DeFever and I have been discussing. I also happen to agree that for a number of those things that, that really fall under this food and beverage uh, concept, that is a little, I think, that's a bit of a stickier wicket because it seems to me that that's something that traditionally has, has been fraught with a lot of debate and feelings that it that it might be appropriate to remain as conditional use permit. My my up my last point is more kind of supplemental to this discussion to try to figure out how we might actually use um, this as leverage to really encourage and enhance the mixed use the housing piece of all of this. So if we could my my own idea 
would be that we would take out food and beverage, or at least parts of food and beverage. The liquor store is an example that's included in food and beverage right now. To take out some of those things, which is very much characterized in the including but not limited to language, but take out things such as that, have them remain as conditional use permits. But then for those other things that are, in Dina's words, otherwise CUPs, say, listen, it's going to be permitted, a uh, shoe store. Um, but, if, uh, but if you're going to make it mixed use. I, uh, I, under, under, I understand um, that proposal. I, I'm not sure that it's consistent with what Commissioner DeFever was saying because I, um, there, there are potentially other items as I look as I look through the list, and I thought I heard Commissioner DeFever saying this that there are other items that sort of I, fall into the category of you know potentially requiring a little bit more review. Um, Sarah, although I want to correct myself, I see that even though mortuaries, as an example, right. was crossed off on page 21, it still is listed use. as conditional <laughs> yeah, use permit yeah, exactly. on the graph, and I, I, I missed that. So maybe we should just go through, maybe the, the, the exercise that we might consider taking is just going through. Um, I, I, I hear that we're all in agreement as to food, or, or that we're maybe there is a possibility of consensus as to food and beverage, um, sort of taking that out of the category. Uh, we're just returning that to the to to, to uh, uses that require a conditional use permit. Um, other other categories, as Commissioner Sy is proposing, that now that once required a commission conditional use permit, but that now are just considered permittable, permitted uses. We can add the caveat. Um, I think that you have recommended for for. I'm sorry, things that require conditional use permits, we add the caveat to try to encourage mixed use development. Where it's, are there particular areas was, where you're suggesting that where, where the, something here is requiring a conditional use permit, but we want to encourage mixed use development? No, it was, it was the opposite. My idea was that this, the concept of, of allowing uh, things to just go through ministerial review Right. You could get. You could have that, if you're going to be doing mixed use. Right. So the things it, that are currently out, other than the food and beverage category, that does that that doesn't uh, the other areas that are now shown as conditional requiring conditional use permits would stay conditional use. Okay. Period. Full stop. It would right. stay conditional use. But things such as personal services, which I by and large, by by the way, agree with that that could be ministerial and it, I, I wouldn't have too much of a problem with it but that we hinge this on you getting that that privilege of just getting ministerial review if you're doing mixed housing or a mixed use so making it a u instead of a p but adding an exception for mixed use developers yes although i don't think you'd have to change these things to all be you i think there actually could be language that you could add that would simply say that for those things that are designated as P, they are subject to it being mixed use. Um, and that's assuming that it's that, that kind of idea is workable, why, which is why I posed it to staff. M my only point in all of this, by the way, and it, and it, it may be something that is so unworkable that maybe we, sh we shouldn't consider, but what I like about it is that it, it recognizes the fact that there's nothing wrong with the system that we have for conditional use permits. There is a reason why it was enacted in the code in the first place. If there's something wrong with it, that I think is the obligation of Dina and staff to say it is wrong and it, and it cannot go further with that. And I think, Dina, you need to be pretty full-throated if that's the case. Otherwise, it seems to me that we, can, we could maintain the process that we have. Well, that gets to a concern that I have is that I, I did hear that there were a number of reasons why the, the staff and consultants have recommended this approach. Um, and one of them was just that from the staff perspective and their perspective goes back longer than ours in many ways in terms of this, what, what makes sense. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't want to 
take all of that away from because a lot of thinking is going in has gone into this and take all of this away and 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 you know um, eliminate that efficiency that better process that more streamlined process that staff is trying to achieve I don't have any objection to to kind of recommending that we look more deeply that this is a consideration um, for the council that they consider doing this adding that lang some sort of language um, uh, to incentivize you know mixed-use development and and um, but I do think that I would also encourage, you know, Dina and staff to, to, at that time of consideration before town council, to really articulate all the rationale behind, fully articulate the rationale behind this approach that you've proposed to us. So I think what I'm hearing, and I just want to make sure, is that, and this is just that, and, and maybe it's a question as well. So what I'm hearing is, I think there was great concern about the food and beverage piece. And just, and, and looking at what, um, in my time here, what we've brought before you and how long it takes sometimes just to talk about hours of operation with respect to restaurants, bars, places that um, have any entertainment, that you have some pause. And it's perfectly rational and I understand it completely because you're you have to deal with this more than I do actually. Um, so there's nothing wrong with making those conditional. Nothing wrong with making those conditional it makes it a lot easier for us as well. Um, it, it easier for us in the sense that rather than going through and piecing through and deciding which one gets it if it's a mixed use and which one doesn't, I think from a simple streamlining perspective and from an application perspective and from us just implementing this as a, as a text and staff kind of looking at it from um, what goes where and how to deal with it, that we look at that piece right there as a conditional use throughout. And there, I don't think that that would preclude too much. Um, I know that there are restaurants okay. that will come in as part of a mixed use development and part of what they'll do is go through the conditional use permit process. Um, I think what you're trying to avoid is restaurants coming in and you have um, people in the public who are not happy because of some type of impact that's either late night hours well, or whatever. that is very helpful. Uh, I mean, I think I, you know, certainly, uh, I think that's, if, if you think that this is something I, that would I be mean, you a know, simler way to do it, that's not going to, in in I don't think, I, I'm, I, I the, really appreciate where Commissioner Sai is coming from, but I'm not sure that we're in the best position to, figure out how and best to and encourage. You know, if I might interrupt, in a perfect world, we of course would love it if restaurants were able to just come in and they could, restaurant tours do, I don't know that everybody else does, that you, they come in and they can open up a restaurant, it doesn't take them another six months to go through a public hearing process. But being the sensitive, that there's this is such a sensitive topic for the Planning Commission and, and I would say for the community as a whole, we can certainly consider this as a recommendation that we go forward with that being a conditional use. Um, I, I, I don't know if I feel as strongly, and it doesn't matter what I feel, but just from a staff perspective with things like in the retail sections for florists and furniture stores and things like that, I mean, I don't really see that as something that um, creates an impact that is of concern based on how they operate. And in the same manner with I think the only thing that, the only one that jumped out, and as I'm looking through the list, you know, trying to process it all, the only one that jumped out to me is just the auto parts, auto sales, sales rentals, and, and rentals. auto parts. That one seems qualitatively a bit different from um, a candy store. <laughs> uh, and so that's in retail. I'm, I'm, and I'm, this is table 23A. Am I looking at page 23? Am I looking at the right? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I you have are. that circle as well, auto sales. Yeah, and that, that was the only one that, um, you know, s again, you know, I think might as well go through and make sure that we've looked through the different categories and how, and, and uh, that we're comfortable. It's up to the co commission, but there's another automotive maintenance and repair services section of this chart. So, and that requires a conditional use permit. So oh. we're certainly open to moving okay. things around. That's what oh, maybe you could put that in the same space, the auto sales and rentals, put it where the auto maintenance is. Auto, yeah, maybe put that there. That makes more sense, I think. Okay. I'd like and to also, if you don't mind, um, call attention just to a couple, uh, at least one item that's in the, uh, the food section that you might consider maintaining is 
permitted. And that would be the uh, the grocery store. And, yes, and there may I had be issues that. there. Um, I think the way this plays out, you know, is that those things that are made conditional would not be uh, a developer might not include that in their development application. The building might be built. Usually, not. there might be a conditional use permit that is granted for a use later. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that okay. because All I right. think that they could do a corner use and that would be, they would they would look at it as a, as a plus. I don't know if it would, would stop them as much if they had to go through a conditional process. But a lot of jurisdictions do with respect to alcohol use and, you know, entertainment. Right, but they, they would follow a different track perhaps. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Because <laughs> if, they're, if they're being granted sort of this fast track um, they may want, they may choose to stay on the fast track and and not go after things that would require the the additional um, discretionary review. So um, so those things that really uh, the town can get behind in terms of being part of a fast track application, um, those would remain permitted, and those things that be willing to at least in the in the short term sort of uh, allow to fall by the wayside if a developer chooses to take the fast track would be in the, under the conditional use category. I, I completely agree with you. Grocery stores probably should be removed from there, maybe given its own section or- Could put in a retail. Put, yeah, put right. somewhere else, retail, right. that makes sense. Right. And S not to open Pandora's box, but why are we um, not allowing souvenir shops, but we're allowing liquor stores? <laughs> I mean, it just seems a little discordant. <laughs> I'm not against liquor stores at all, believe me, but it, it just looks discordant <laughs> to me. <laughs> I, I think the souvenir shops is something um, that we've kept in there so to make sure that uh, we don't have a bunch of um, souvenir shops and start looking like some of our neighbors I refuse uh -huh. to mention. <laughs> Yes, we all know this. Yes. They came up, that, that some of our neighbors came up at the town council meeting on Monday as well. Um, okay, so am I correct? And you, are you satisfied with, you mentioned some other categories, um, bus stops, but I think we, we determined that that is, is subject to a conditional actually, use permit. Actually, conditional okay. use permit, yeah. I missed so that it was actually it different. It sounds like what's on the table is, ta is taking auto parts, auto sales, and rentals, and auto parts that language out of the retail section and plugging it into the automotive maintenance and repair services, which seems reasonable, um, taking, uh, making, um, taking uh, grocery stores out of the food and beverage section and putting that up into the retail section, uh, and then making the food and beverage uh, category sans grocery stores uh, uh, subject to a condition, the conditional use permit process, so we'd make that a U instead of a P. I think that's those are the ideas that we have batted around tonight. Is it really controversial to allow souvenir shops, but with a conditional use permit? Uh, what's the history on that? I don't know all the history, but I know that there there is some feeling about souvenir shops on Main Street. They Just are, they are. I'm sorry. They're, um, they are permitted in Main Street and Village Commercial. Oh, okay, so I'm only uh, looking at one graph. Table 2-A, yeah. So it's just the one zone they're not permitted in. Okay. They're not permitted in Neighborhood Commercial or Mixed Use. I missed that, thank you. Oh, okay, right. so they are permitted sometimes. Okay, just yeah. wondering, it seemed a little odd. <laughs> oh, that's a good point though, we have to also, I'm, we're looking at several, two different tables, so. Although they're automatically permitted in the uh, which one is it they're permitted? Mixed it, it's mixed table use? 2A, mm -hmm. and they're automatically permit. They're permitted in Main Street and Village Commercial. Yeah. Maybe that should be conditional, given the history of the town. I'm sorry, I missed the, I was looking at the chart, and I missed what the discussion. Uh, they're automatic, uh, souvenir shops 28. are automatically permitted, page 28. It's kind of hard to read, it says, Souvenir shops are automatically? Yeah, mixed use, village, no, they're automatically permitted in village commercial, and what, what's MS again? Main Street. Main Street. I'm losing my mind. Uh, maybe those should be conditional use given the history of our town. 
in, just in case we have maybe I trust the staff we have now inherently, but maybe Dina's not here and you know she approves one and the next person who comes in approves two more and maybe those should be looked at given the history of the town. Right. And then I guess one other use that's in the food and beverage that might uh, fall in the same category as the grocery store would be the convenience markets. You know, would you uh, would you want those to be conditional? I don't know. That's that that would. So it's sort of like grocery stores. You're saying convenience well, convenience market would be a, kind of call it a small book grocery store. You know, where, so, you, where it's right. only five thousand square right. feet instead of twenty, um, and and you'd be, be the best judge of that because you've seen a <laughs> lot of these? <laughs> you've had a lot We've of never hearings. seen yeah. a yeah. <laughs> I don't have too stores? much experience with convenience stores, but I understand are these, it. Are these convenience stores with or without alcohol? Well, I'll be without alcohol, I think. <laughs> so this is, I feel like, uh, well, you know, you, you do have to it's remember. a philosophical question as it's to whether a or not a convenience question. store is a, subset, a subcategory of grocery store, <laughs> and a how species we, of grocery store. I, I don't know if we have a definition for those, but yes, <laughs> it's, a, it's a definite, yeah. But uh, qualified as being without alcohol. Okay, that's a great that's but, a great uh, suggestion. We, Those should be if we do that, that's, a good idea. that's a really retail. good suggestion. That's if you if you want to do that, it would have to be you want to say without alcohol or because you know convenience store is abroad. I, I don't want to put the stake in the heart here, <laughs> but when I hear convenience store, people are going to think some numbers that come into mind. Right, particular stores, mm -hmm. chains of stores <laughs> that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably would get <laughs> objections about like July 11th, you know, <laughs> right? Right, so okay, yeah, some awesome, some very important things for us to consider. <laughs> We're trying to avert disaster in the future, yes. Um, not that any of these, as permitted, would be disastrous, but disastrous for all of us in this room for not planning ahead. <laughs> I didn't anticipate that this would be the, <laughs> the hot topic for the evening. Um, well, let's let's just take it. And in terms of making the recommendation, just in, again, in terms of you know, um, can, can we? We're going to talk through. Let's just talk through and try to try to pull this process together. Talk through table three A. Be specific with staff about our recommendations and then move on to the next table so that we're, is that? Just walk through that, both of them. Yeah, we'll just walk through it. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if, if it may be, it may be, uh, may, perhaps I should, we should give ourselves a, a minute or two to, to read through the table. Are, do you, have you read through, Commissioner Stey, do you feel that you've read through the whole table? and? I, something new that will co crop up. I, I've I've read through it. I mean, the, the the main problem is it's it's just kind of a drafting issue, which is the language is similar but not the same as what's in the original list of things that require a conditional mm -hmm. use permit. That's right. just what it is. So we're there's there's not going to be a solution for us un, unless we kind of revert. I think potentially back to that original list to simply take out from the original list those things that we would kind of prefer to be ministerial permit process or fast track as as was described as a good description well but they already have them grouped in nice groupings like I know, retail but it, and and this <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not casting aspersions on the very hard work that people have done i think there's value in the grouping but it, it just raises issues because remember that in the interest of efficiency and, and kind of consolidation, the, the language by its own terms says including but not limited to. So it's, 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 a, it, it just, it's a door opener um, to what is otherwise for say retail or even food and beverage is going to now be default a ministerial process. I mean, that, at the end of the day, it's a recommendation of staff. I, I, I take it the staff believes that it's, it's, it's more burden, and it's not a criticism, but that it's more burden 
to have it go through a CUP process than for it to be permitted. And is that fair to say? That is absolutely correct. Yeah. And, and, and that's where I think this commission, ultimately the council just has to decide whether it agrees or disagrees. I, I happen to just disagree on food and beverage for having sat at this dais on, on enough of these to where I think there's value to it. That, that's okay, reasonable minds can disagree <laughs> on that and that is okay. For others of these, I happen to very much agree that they're the kinds of things, in Dina's words, somewhat words, that there's just not a lot of controversy that has or will happen. It, it, it just isn't. And I think that's one where we reasonably could say, yeah, go ahead and just let it be kind of fast-tracked. Um, the, my earlier proposal, I'm happy to dispense with because it doesn't say like anyone likes it at all. Um, and that's okay. But, I, but I, it, I think we can use the chart and other than the ones that have been identified so far, I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm fine with them. I really okay. am. But that's only because we're I, agreeing with you, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. I, no, my question you. was but actually more straightforward. Do you need a minute or two to read no, through the full chart so we so we capture all the thoughts? I don't. At one time. But that's my point. You're never going to be able to capture right. every single no, one. I, so yeah. you, there's really no point in trying to do so because it's. Oh, an, you mean beyond the the list yeah. because it says including, including but not, not limited. Okay, to. you're thinking further than I am. <laughs> right. Well. Yeah, we can, you know, I, I pre, I, yes, it's, it's sort of imperfect from that perspective, but we can make some tweaks that might help. Oh, for help. sure. And the tweaks that have been identified, I, I agree with. Okay. But I, I just, I wouldn't encourage us to try to identify more because okay. no. it's an innumerable okay, number. Okay, so let's go through. Um, okay, so why don't we, so I'm just trying to think of, just, just, to, just for, so that the record's clear and the recommendation is clear. Um, uh, so, uh, certainly if we need to hark back to it and we may make a motion. Um, for table 2-3A, um, under the retail section, we're moving, we recommend that the words auto parts and auto sales and rentals and auto parts be moved to the section in table 2-3A entitled automotive maintenance and repair services. Uh, we recommend that under the food and beverage section, the um, grocery, grocery stores, stores, convenience markets without alcohol, convenience Evo. markets with without with that do not sell alcohol, alcohol be moved to retail. Be moved to retail. So, grocery stores, convenience markets, you're thinking of them as a smaller market, really, when you're thinking about a convenience, there may be a six pack of beer that gets involved. I, I would recommend that we take, we leave grocery, we, we just take out grocery stores and put that under retail, but we leave convenience stores under, under food and beverage there you and go. have that go through Good idea. a conditional use pr Rather process, a CUP process. Yeah. So. So, so, the, so we recommend taking out grocery stores and putting that under um, retail, uh, and then otherwise for the food and beverage category, changing that to um, conditional use. And that, I believe, is the extent of the recommendations vis-a-vis -vis that table. And then um, turning to table 2-A, and without having looked at the whole table, we know it's not identical, so, so I do need a moment just to look at it because I don't. Other than souvenir shops, what is different about table, this table on page 28 from the previous table? So are you, are you making a motion or are you just going to? I'm just to trying to articulate the recommendations okay. so we okay. can capture them. I'm capturing, I'm following yeah. you, I just <laughs> wanna make sure. And I'm realizing we just kinda have to talk through them one piece at a time. Um, so on, and so the question, the question of your staff, it, which would just facilitate this process is, what is different, uh, I know that souvenir shops, for example, is different. Is there anything that's in this table on page 28 of the staff memorandum that's different from the previous table that we just reviewed?
Unfortunately, Bob Brown, who drafted this, is not here tonight. So, I'm looking at it right yeah, and we'll, we'll look, do the we'll same. Look so we'll, we'll do okay. the same. Well, auto parts don't appear in retail. That's one. Or auto sales and but yeah, there's no no auto, auto sales in this one. You do it's have some here. animal care and boarding, which is a use permit. So. Oh, there is an animal. I don't think there's that much difference. Yeah, it's looking. It looks pretty similar to me. Yeah. Uh, they do have animal care and boarding in the other one. It's just underneath my clips. I didn't see it. Um, it looks pretty similar to me. I mean... Okay, so then, uh, so if that's the case, we don't see automotive under retail. So then we're just uh, removing um, grocery store from grocery stores from food, food, the food and beverage section, and moving that up into retail, mm -hmm. and then just changing the food and beverage se se section at large to a conditional use permit. So that's the recommendation versus that table. But can I ask a question? So for something like. Um, uh, auto parts, auto sales, rentals, and auto parts. It's in, as we just discussed, 2-3-A, but not 2-A. Why, why, why did staff recommend that? What, what's the logic for the distinction? So let me follow you. So on page, which pages are you, which charts I'm trying to, so, uh, so in 23A, which I think is at page yes. 23, okay. the retail, it includes things like the auto parts, auto sales. In table 2A, which is at page 28, I believe, under retail, it does not have that. That's as staff drafted it. And I'm just curious what the reasoning was behind why it's included in, that, in, in, in one of the tables but not the other. I believe it has to do with it being in Main Street and the mixed use and the village commercial for that one on page 28. That makes sense. Which is 2A. So we just looked at it from a different zone and didn't apply it there. However, if you look on the next, I think it's on page, oop, I'm sorry. On page 29, there is automotive services, including but not limited to gas stations, car washes, and vehicle repair that we require conditional use permits there. So it's... It does say including but not limited yes, to. Yes, that's so why. So it could... still I wide mean, open. Yeah, staff could definitely interpret auto sales and, you know, um, rentals okay. as similar as automotive services. I mean, if someone came to the counter today, I, I don't have everything listed. I have to do a little interpretation, and I think I could interpret it in that manner. Yeah, so I'm fine with leaving that that way. Do my fellow commissioners have any thoughts about leaving souvenir shops as permitted? Uh, I, I'm fine leaving it as mm -hmm. permitted. Um, I I think that this it, this this there is no reason for souvenir shops to be listed separately other than what might be kind of historical reference to an aversion what it appears to be to souvenir shop. <laughs> right. Um, but it, 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 is, it is no different than I think any of the other retail shops, at least in my mind. Would you suggest that we move it to retail then? Is that a thought? I, I have no problem with that. Well, you personally, have. Personally, I'm agnostic on that one. Oh. It says permitted in two categories, but not in the in the M. Oh, that's true. And so the mixed use. So maybe we have to keep it separate. Maybe let's not touch Just it. Just for clarity, yeah. I mean, we yeah might as well make the tables fairly consistent in that way. Um, okay. Uh, is that the only? Those are the only two zone. Uh, it's just uh, the zones where the the that appears. Correct. I think that's everything, yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. So back to I, so that's our so we're making recommendations as to specific um, language, and then we're kind of now we will turn back to site to the site H issue, which I believe I understood. Um, uh, we had talked previously about um, with regard to that specific issue, recommending a, sort of a conditional uh, effective date um, where that sort of, to the extent, and maybe I should be specific about the, um, it's, it's the R310 zone. Um, that zoning is effective as of January 31st, 2024, and we had, 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 is there a consensus that we're specific to that portion of the zoning code that is under review tonight? The effective date? That the recommendation is, Just is approve piece. the proposed amendments with this, this exception, with, with incorporating the draft language that we have proposed vis-a-vis -vis the tables and then with this exception of uh, uh, site H, which uh, zoning, the, the R310 uh, the zoning, which would become effective uh, um, January 24th, I'm sorry, January 31st, 2024. <laughs> well, as, as the person who's largely responsible for, responsible for bollocksing up <laughs> the team's <laughs> document, um, yes, my idea would be to make it conditionally, or rather um, um, effective January 31, 2024, as to that R310. Now, I think the issue on the table is, do you want to like even make it more specific to that site H issue? I don't have a problem with that. I just don't know whether the language can be constructed in such a way to, to be specific to a particular site maybe it can and i, don't and know. I have well, a and I, question yeah. that relates to that so i still have reservations about approving the site h at all so i would like to ask if two commissioners would like to adopt that out of three and i either abstain or object to adopting that what would happen to the entire zoning amendments? Would they not pass, or is two out of three enough for it to carry nonetheless? So zoning text amendment recommendations, unlike general plan recommendations, require a majority of the quorum that's present in voting. Okay. So a, a two-one vote passes in this situation. Okay. So I don't need to ask the uh, resulting questions that I would ask if, uh, <laughs> if there would not be a quorum with two, because I think maybe we're headed that direction. Yeah. Okay. Well, but could, but could, the, um, could the recommendation be made to the council that is kind of essentially splitting apart aspects of the zoning regs? So for that, that's what I was going to ask, but I think maybe I don't need Two? Wait. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to make it more complicated if I didn't need to, so I can just. And just, I just want to be, I'm, I, I don't know what's happening today. We're all a bit <laughs> off our game, I think. Um, and I'm, I know I'm tired, but are you saying this is sort of a protest vote of, uh, you're not, you're, you object to the, to the town council's adoption of the general plan and certification of the IR that embraced site H as a, as a, as a, a, a um, so, so, well, I can't really object to that because I approved it at the last meeting. But what I object to but, is changing you didn't the approve, zoning code. You based. recommended to the town council, and they I, I did something different. Just, you did something different. Correct. I do. Yes. But it has I been adopted. To that part. That general plan has been adopted. The EIR has been certified. Okay, you're right. Thank just, you. You're just articulating to be clear, that's my not thoughts on your agenda better. tonight. No, I, no, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, you know what, I, I, I recognize that. I'm, 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 are clarifying that the protest that I think to Commissioner DeFever was. That was just a reminder to all of us that what has already happened, and we have a general plan in place, and we have an EIR that's been certified, and now, and and that's we're kind of stuck with it. You're, you know. you're articulating it better than I am, actually. That is exactly right. Okay. 
I actually think it's a mistake to adopt Site H because of the public health, safety, and welfare considerations. And so what I would like to do is not approve, either not approve what we just discussed as the conditional approval that would be in effect in January, and I'm just the vote who not does not approve so because of my concerns. you can't make the findings that you would need to make to be Correct. able to. Or if we split solution. it, which is what okay. Commissioner Sai was saying, maybe we need to split it, and then I would just not approve the portion with site H, but I, I do approve the rest Understood. of it. Understood. Okay, thanks. Okay. You could do that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, yeah. I just wanted to make sure it's all happening so fast. I know, I just and thank make sure you. we were all on the same page in terms of what's before us and what we're. Well, and I'm not suggesting that you've all made your decisions either. I mean, maybe now that I've said that, <laughs> that airs um, other alternatives, um, but that's how I feel about it. So I wanted to make sure I understand maybe what the options would be given that that's how I feel about well, it. Well, unfortunately, we really haven't had a chance to, to talk about, but do you mind articulating because this was presented in a, in a correspondence to us as well, um, the, ba the basis for that, or th that there are reasons that have been proposed for not being able to make that finding. Um, and do you mind articulating sort of your basis for? Um, well, broadly, I object to this. I, I think the state is forcing us to adopt things that conflict with our own principles. And I broadly object to that already at the outset. Um, they're taking control of our own zoning, of our own general plan. They're taking the control, and it's not, this isn't about me as a planning commissioner, it's about the people of Tiburon. The state is now removing the decision-making abilities from the people of Tiburon, and I object to this, which is why when it gets specific with Site H, we did our best two weeks ago to advise that, okay, we understand that procedurally, as planning commissioners, we don't have a choice but to do what the state is directing, and we understand that context very well. We've, we've asked many questions, we understand the law, we understand how this is all playing out. But when you get to the specifics down with Site H, I think it is a public safety and welfare issue. And I look at our, we're, we're meant to adopt this resolution that says that we find that the proposed amendments are not detrimental to the public health, safety, and welfare of the town. I can't find that. Just, just and just a follow up question. Without, there's no, there's no actual development application on the table, so there's nothing specific that's been proposed. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm sort of grappling with this too. Yeah. Um, just, just the designation itself of this, of the, uh, the, the zoning amendment that addresses a f potential future uh, development application, you find that that is um, detrimental to the public health, safety, and welfare of the town? As presented, yes. Now I know that things could could change, they can be adapted, but as presented to me, I am not comfortable with it. Um, just for just for a little bit of history uh, on the Planning Commission, and it has been raised by, by the residents of the neighborhood around Paradise Drive, this is something we would have never approved otherwise, never under our previous general plan. We're only now considering it because the state is forcing the new regulations on us. I'm just not comfortable with it. I'm, I can see why density downtown can be justified for public health, safety, and welfare. We can put more density downtown. We have you know, services downtown. We have transit. We, you know, we don't have these issues of a winding uh, road uh, on a cliff, basically, uh, with no services. Uh, on Paradise Drive, I can understand accelerating housing in certain zones of Tiburon, and, and I feel comfortable saying that we can adopt those, but I don't feel comfortable with adding, because we're, at, we're being asked to specifically say that Site H 
as part of the amendment, and it's also very odd that we're being asked to do specific things, and I raised this two weeks ago, our general plan now has very not general things in it, very specific things, like suddenly the Reed School site is in the general plan. That's not a general plan. That's not our hopes and dreams uh, for the future of Tiburon. All these housing elements are being shoehorned in there, and they're too specific for a general plan. We've been, our hand has been forced to do this. I disagree with it. But when we're faced with this again, where we do have the option to put in different sites, so, so I, can, I can accept that the general plan is no longer as general as what I imagined it should be. But when we're, we're looking at very specific sites and that I'm supposed to find in this resolution that a specific site is not detrimental to public health, safety, or welfare, I'm suddenly very uncomfortable. So that's why right. I'm asking. Uh, I'm not trying to derail all of the work <laughs> that has been done thus far, but I do want to put my objection right. to I understand. this yeah, thank specific you. forcing. Getting that on the record, yeah. yes. No, I think I, 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 <laughs> you know, the, it's a, the point is well taken. I, 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 unfortunately, because the statement of overriding considerations has been adopted, um, I, you know, I feel like I, I, I totally understand wanting to put that objection on the record. Yeah. Um, I think that it, I'm not sure that, um, just personally, the impact, I, I, it's not gonna change the outcome um, because the town council, as Commissioner Sy has already, has already noted, has already made a decision and here, here we are. Yeah, um, I, I don't think that so, the overriding objections address this complex situation we're in if, right? sufficiently either. Well, you know, we had, we had a, an EIR that, that addressed the general plan um, and I think it was very clear that there were, say, there were impacts, there are environmental impacts to development of Site H that are not likely not mitigated, you know, can be mitigated. And that is what led to the statement of overriding considerations, that there were other, you know, in the town council's estimation, it's not what we recommended because we recommended removing Site H, but in the town council's estimation and decision, um, they disagreed and they decided that for policy reasons and the reasons outlined in the statement of overriding considerations that they, they wanted to certify the EIR. And they had, I do think they had legitimate reasons for doing so from a, the, a, the, the, uh, the you know, perspective of wanting to move that process along to avoid the builder's remedy and risk that would impact all of the towns, all of the zones, and be kind of everybody's worst case scenario, you know. And so I get where they were coming from, but I totally agree with you that it wasn't the recommendation that we made, you know, um, that I can, I've always believed and continue to believe that, that um, the recommendation that we made that was the right one, but I do appreciate the perspective of the town council. And I don't think I would, I think I would just to move forward this proposal that a, a community member has uh, has offered to us of, of deferring kind of the, you know, um, uh, effectiveness to allow for time for some other creative work to hopefully be done or thought to be brought to bear on this to maybe try to find some alternative sites or, you know, other types of resolutions is maybe the more, con is the more constructive way forward at this point in time, given where we are. But I, I totally understand. I share the same disappointments. You know, and I heard the town council members say why they didn't want to, um, why they didn't like, the, you know, why they had issues with downtown and, development. I don't agree, but respectfully don't agree. And Chair Williams, I apologize for interrupting you, and I certainly understand that all these inter issues are somewhat interrelated, but the issue before the commission right. tonight is the requested um, recommendation on the zoning code amendments that are before you. I understand. You. Yeah, just that Commissioner DeFever had brought up, a, a, you know, her desire to put thoughts on the record. Uh, understood. And to the to the extent that those apply to the health and safety findings and the recommendation on the site age, that's completely on your agenda this evening. <laughs> Well, um, so I, I think moving forward, I think the recommendation, I mean, I, I don't know, if, you know, I, I, I would sort of move to, 
trying to trying to build consensus. We haven't done that entirely, um, I think. Or, or which is completely fine. I mean, yeah, maybe yeah. Commissioner Sai would like to. Yeah, I also don't think we need we we have to have consensus where there isn't consensus, Absolutely. right? Right. Um, but I, you know, I read the the resolution itself, which is part of what kind of the the findings were required to make, just slightly differently. And it's because I view the question on the table today different from the one. It is necessarily different from the one that was on the table two, three weeks ago. I completely understand the points that Commissioner DeFever is making, but as I read the resolution, but more specific to what we're looking at today with respect to the proposed changes and amendments to the zoning uh, regulations, it, it is in fact consistent and necessary for the protection of public health, safety, and welfare to adopt zoning regulations that are consistent with the general plan. That's a separate question of whether or not normatively the general plan is right or wrong. But that decision was made, right or wrong, by the council. And so to the extent that the Planning Commission's role is to make sure, at least from the recommendation stage that we're at, that the regulations themselves are consistent with other regulations, the general plan, to the extent that's our job, at least today, I think this, the, the, the amendments as discussed accomplish that. What, what, I, what I liked, I continue to like, about the idea of a, of a delayed effective date is that we've done our job, and I mean that in an important way, we've done the job of what a planning commission needs to do, but it still allows for, I think, very important debate, which includes debate with HCD, that can still happen. And that then allows, even just by the function of how it would be effective, the council potentially to come back and change its own mind. And that was the point I made earlier. I totally agree. And thank you so much. You articulated, I think, what I was trying to articulate. You did a great job. Or I was where I was trying to go in a totally inartful way, but I, I wholeheartedly agree um, with Commissioner Sai. Um, so I do feel comfortable making making the overall findings um, and and, um, and moving forward um, to, to recommend to the council that that they um, uh, uh, adopt uh, our resolution recommending uh, or that we adopt a resolution recommending adoption of the to run uh, of the zoning um, amendments uh, with the the exception with an exception as to site three <laughs> four dash ten um, and there our recommendation would be that there's a um, an effective date as to as to, to that um, zone. I don't have the precise amendment. Uh, I'm sorry, zoning codes sections in my mind. Um, but but as to site three dash ten, that that be effective as of January thirty first, twenty twenty four. Excuse me. R R three. I'm sorry. R three dash ten. I'm sorry. Yes. What did you. I say? <laughs> you said S. Because you know, there's been a site H, so you know. It's Sorry, like, it's like, I just want to make sure on the record. It's Absolutely, correct. yeah. I didn't even catch myself doing that. Um, R three um, dash ten. That uh, um, so th yeah, effective date of January thirty uh, first, twenty twenty four, um, and that we're also recommending that they make the changes to table um, two uh, A two dash uh, three A and um, table 2-A uh, that we articulated to staff. And I hope I don't need to repeat those. <laughs> so I, that's the motion I am making. Well, the, the only um, f friendly amendment I'd, I'd put out there is that to the extent that Commissioner DeFever has articulated that she would support the remainder of the amendments that what we might consider doing essentially are two otherwise identical resolutions, one of which is specific to the amendments applicable to what is going to be create R-3-10, and then the other resolution would pertain to the remainder of the zoning amendments, and to the extent that that is something that can be done. It, it, if I may, um, Commissioner Sy, I think you can do that in one resolution. I okay. think you can, okay. you can say, enough. you can take two actions, you know, and, and have two separate votes if you would like. Great. Fair enough. Thank you for that. And, and, and that would, of course, be better than two otherwise identical resolutions. And so I just didn't realize it could be done in one. But if so, 
I, that, I think that will allow for Commissioner DeFever to, to be able to articulate her votes in that way. So with and that I, amendment to the motion? Yes, an right. amendment as I noted, right. yes. Okay. And, and with that, I would second okay. the motion that the chair has made. Is that, so with that amendment to the motion, which has been seconded by Commissioner Sai. That you're gonna take two separate votes. Yes. And yes. whichever one you wanna take up first, it's up to you. If I missed that direction, I apologize. Do you want to take up? Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, so, I, I think what council was suggesting was that we I thought this is one resolution. Just, we, no, one resolution, right. but I two think council actions. was suggesting it would be two votes and it would be manifest ultimately in one resolution. Correct, and if I'm understanding correctly, you're gonna take one vote with respect to what I'm gonna call site H or your R3-10 zoning. And, okay. Okay. and a separate vote so, for so the remainder. So that's a separate motion though. No, I'm sorry. It's a, so you, you've so, made a motion, so sorry, I apologize. Go yeah. On. No, I'm just, I'm just so I've, I've sort of made the motion which has been amended to, to, to have two separate votes on this motion, one vote. And so now do we, I'll take, let's take a vote on R <laughs> dash, dash three, three dash, dash 10, yeah. and we'll take that vote. So we'll have. Just to be clear, because I think there may be some misunderstanding here. You're gonna take a vote with respect to R dash three dash 10, and the motion on the table includes deferral, or I believe the motion on the table is recommend that the council you recommend those changes, but that the council defer their effectiveness until January 31, 2024. Exactly. Then there's a second part to your motion, which is all the other changes that are included in the uh, packet in your resolution tonight in the zoning amendments with the changes that were read into the record to the tables 2-2 and 2-3A. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay. Whew, right, yes, yes. So and so I yes, except, <laughs> except I forgot to mention a typo that I found. <laughs> it, no, uh, although that might be one too. This one is luckily and mercifully easy, I think. Uh, it's, give me a second. It's um, on page 21. Um, Red line paragraph five. And the typo is um, in the last sentence before the subparagraph A, the, the sentence currently says, uses identified as you shall require approval of a conditional use permit and compliance with the provisions of section 16-52.040 conditional use permit is required prior to. I, I think it's missing the word and. Sorry, what page, are you on? page 21. So and, it's omission, typo. Uh, fair, fair ah. enough. Just want to let you know. It's, it's, it's there, is, there is a typo that I wanted to <laughs> tell you about where we do say puppies in two yeah, we do. We don't spell puppies correctly, so we'll, we'll change but, that as but, well. But Dina, just important clarification: is, is that correct that it's an yeah. omission? And I, I think that that's I think the only way I could make the sentence make sense and in my is own required. mind. I, th I think that is an omission of an and. Yes. So that's with regard to section code section 16-22.030, paragraph five. The yes. second sentence, use is identified as yes. you shall require approval of a conditional use permit in compliance with the provisions of section 16-52.040, conditional use permit, and is required prior to. That's correct. Yes, okay. So that is also recommend, recommended language change. Um, 
Okay, so now I'm catching up to, so we'll start with the vote on the, the first action vis-a-vis R-10-3. Uh, Roll call vote, I would imagine, since call, we might have. Yes. Okay. Um, Commissioner Sai. Which Aye. one are we voting on? I'm sorry. R, R, this is site H, R dash. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner DeFever. Nay. Chair Williams. Aye. The vote carries two to one. And then the second vote as to um, the second vote as to the remainder um, of the um, zoning amendments with the uh, recommended language. Um, Even the changes read into the record by the chair with respect to table 2-2 and 2-3A and the two, um, one omission and one typo uh, <laughs> uh, also read into the record by Commissioner Sai, I believe, Thank and you. your um, community development director. And so maybe we have roll call on that vote. Yes, you may. Commissioner DeFever. Aye. Commissioner Asai. Aye. And Chair Williams. Aye. Motion carries 3-0. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>